Welcome to the Huberman Lab podcast, where we discuss science and science-based tools for everyday life. I'm Andrew Huberman, and I'm a professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology at Stanford School of Medicine. My guest today is Dr. Kay Tai. Dr. Kay Tai is a professor of neuroscience at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. She did her training at MIT and at Stanford, and is currently an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute which is a highly curated group of individuals who are incentivized to do high risk, high reward work and pioneer new areas of biological study. Throughout her career, Dr. Tai has made fundamental breakthroughs into our understanding of the brain, including demonstrating that a brain area called the amygdala, which most people associate with fear and threat detection, is actually involved in reinforcement of behaviors and experiences that are positive and involve reward. Her current work focuses on various aspects of social interaction, including what happens when we feel lonely or isolated. Indeed, today Kay Tai will tell us about her discovery of so-called loneliness neurons, neurons that give us that sense that we are not being fulfilled from our social interactions. She also describes a phenomenon she discovered called social homeostasis, which is our sense that we are experiencing enough not enough or just enough social interaction, irrespective of whether or not we are an introvert or an extrovert. We also talk about social hierarchies and social rank, how people and animals tear out into so-called alphas and betas, subordinates and dominants, et cetera, in all sorts of social interactions. I think everyone will find that discussion especially interesting. And we talk about the role of social media and online interactions and why despite extensive interaction with many, many individuals, those social media and online interactions can often leave us feeling deprived in specific ways. We talk about the neurochemical, the neural circuit, and some of the hormonal aspects of social interactions. It's a discussion that by the end will have you thinking far more deeply about what is a social interaction and why certain social interactions leave us feeling so good, others feeling sort of meh, and why other social interactions or lack of social interactions can often leave us feeling quite depleted, even depressed. It's a conversation central to mental illness and the understanding of things like depression and anxiety, PTSD and isolation, and it's a conversation central to mental health and in order to build healthy social interactions. Before we begin, I'd like to emphasize that this podcast is separate from my teaching and research roles at Stanford. It is, however, part of my desire and effort to bring zero cost to consumer information about science and science-related tools to the general public. In keeping with that theme, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's podcast. Our first sponsor is 8sleep. 8sleep makes smart mattress covers with cooling, heating, and sleep tracking capacity. Now, I've spoken many times before on this and other podcasts about the fact that sleep is the foundation of mental health, physical health, and performance. Now, one of the key aspects to getting a great night's sleep is to control the temperature of your sleeping environment. And that's because in order to fall and stay deeply asleep, your body temperature actually has to drop by about one to three degrees. And in order to wake up in the morning feeling refreshed, your body temperature actually has to increase by about one to three degrees. Eight Sleep makes it extremely easy to control the temperature of your sleeping environment at the beginning, middle, and throughout the night and when you wake up in the morning. I've been sleeping on an Eight Sleep mattress cover for nearly three years now, and it has dramatically improved my sleep. If you'd like to try Eight Sleep, you can go to eightsleep.com slash Huberman to save $150 off their Pod 3 cover. Eight Sleep currently ships to the USA, Canada, UK, select countries in the EU, and Australia. Again, that's eightsleep.com slash Huberman. Today's episode is also brought to us by Levels. Levels is a program that lets you see how different foods and different activities and your sleep patterns impact your health by giving you real-time feedback on your diet using a continuous glucose monitor. Now, blood glucose, sometimes referred to as blood sugar, has an immediate and long-term impact on your energy levels and your overall health. One of the best ways to maintain focus and energy throughout your day, as well as to keep your so-called metabolic health in best order, is to make sure that your blood glucose never spikes too much, nor does it get too low. With levels, you can monitor how different foods and food combinations impact your blood glucose levels on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. I've been using levels for some time now, and it's really helped me understand which foods and food combinations, exercise schedules, and sleep schedules are optimal for my blood glucose levels and how that translates to energy levels and other metrics of health. If you're interested in learning more about levels and trying a continuous glucose monitor, you can go to levels.link slash Huberman. 
Levels has just launched a new CGM sensor that is smaller and has even better tracking than before. Right now, they're also offering two free months of membership. Again, that's levels.link, L-I-N-K slash Huberman to try the new sensor and two free months of membership. Today's episode is also brought to us by Element. Element is an electrolyte drink that has everything you need and nothing you don't. That means zero sugar and the appropriate ratios of the electrolytes, sodium, magnesium, and potassium. And that correct ratio of electrolytes is extremely important because every cell in your body but especially your nerve cells, your neurons, relies on electrolytes in order to function properly. So when you're well hydrated, and your hydration also includes the appropriate ratios of electrolytes, your mental functioning and your physical functioning is improved. I drink one packet of Element dissolved in about 16 to 32 ounces of water when I wake up in the morning, as well as while I exercise. And if I've sweat a lot during that exercise, I often will drink a third Element packet dissolved in about 32 ounces of water after I exercise. Element comes in a variety of different flavors. Personally, I like all the fruit flavors. So raspberry and watermelon are my favorite. I also like the citrus flavored one. Frankly, I can't really pick just one of the fruit flavors. I like them all so much. And it also comes in chocolate and chocolate mint flavors, which I find are best in the winter months because, of course, you don't just need hydration on hot days and in the summer and spring months, but also in the winter when the temperatures are cold and the environment tends to be dry. If you'd like to try Element, you can go to drinkelement, spelled L-M-N-T dot com slash Huberman, to try a free sample pack. Again, that's drinkelement dot com slash Huberman. And now for my conversation with Dr. K. Tai. Dr. K. Tai, welcome. Andy Huberman, what a treat. Folks are going to hear you call me Andy and wonder if my name is Andy. I always know who I'm speaking to <laughs> according to whether or not they call me Andrew, which is my family and people that I know after a certain period of my life. Drew, which are people that know me through my very brief and a non-illustrious career in boxing, and Andy, which are people that met me as I was coming up through science. Uh, let's just put it this way. There was another Andrew. We did a coin flip and I lost. So Andy is fine. <laughs> Andrew's fine. Whatever makes you comfortable. What's important today is not how anyone refers to me, but rather the discussion about your work, which is spectacular. I've known you a long time and I've been following your career and it's just been amazing and wonderful to see the contributions you've made to science and also to the culture of science. So we're going to talk about both of those things. To kick things off, let's talk about a brain structure that most people I think have heard of, but that is badly misunderstood. And that's the amygdala. Mm -hmm. Most people hear amygdala and they think, oh, Fear. That's what the amygdala is all about. But you know, and I'm hoping you'll educate us on the fact that, that the amygdala is actually far more complex than that mm -hmm. and far more interesting than that. So when you hear the word amygdala, where does your mind go? I agree that a lot of the, the bandwidth on the amygdala has been occupied by fear studies. But we've known actually for a really long time that the amygdala is important for all sorts of emotional processing. Since Kluver and Busey performed lesions on, on monkeys and found that monkeys would then have flat affective responses to all sorts of different stimuli. Poop, food, inanimate object, whatever it was, just no, nothing. No and emotion. No emotional response, no motivational significance, however you want to phrase it, to things that usually would make you either, you know, disgusted or excited or neutral. And so um, I think that that knowledge about the amygdala was there from the beginning. It's not something I came up with. Um, but then it's interesting. It's almost a, it's a meta statement or a meta observation about how scientific research progresses. Sometimes you make a lot of progress in one particular vein because it's easy to press forward there. But it's important to also think about all the other parts and filling in the space in between to make sure you haven't missed anything. So the narrative about the amygdala became about fear. And I think also just when we think about survival, when you are an animal in the natural world, especially if you're a prey animal, which is the majority, you know, that's a lot of animals, um, then you need to prioritize escaping a predator it's immediate threat on your survival versus reward set mating, drinking water, getting food. These things can be done later. 
escaping this predator is paramount. And so there should be some natural asymmetry in how we process emotion at baseline. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that we've looked into a lot as well. But um, I think the, the big picture discovery that um, my team has contributed to our understanding of the amygdala is that it represents a fork in the road uh, for processing emotional valence and thinking about all these old psychological theories about how do you emotionally evaluate the world around you? What's what's the what's the chain of events? Is there a chain of events? What's happening in a certain order um, versus what's happening in parallel? For example, one model is, you know, it, there's all this information that comes in and then we have to filter out what's important. Um, what's going to be something that I need to pay attention to versus what do I need to ignore? If I'm driving, I need to pay attention to the road, this this light, this pedestrian just started walking versus, you know, what it feels like for my sock to be touching my foot. Not super relevant right now or the, my butt against the seat. N not Nothing I need to pay attention to. I need to focus on, you know, the dynamic information. Then you have to select, you know, the second step would be selecting whether it's good or bad and what you want to do with it. And so that process, I think the selection of whether you're um, assigning it a positive or negative valence happens in the amygdala. So glad you brought up this word valence. I think it's a word that some scientists, but most of the general public are probably not familiar with. So let's um, talk about valence. Um, and then I want to go back to the amygdala and um, kind of explore some of its diversity of function a little bit more. So when I hear the word valence, I think goodness versus badness mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, of something. Is that... Basically, yeah. basically, it's been used in a lot of different fields. I think of that, you know, negative and positive numbers or, or um, but I, it's an analogy that we take to just mean, yeah, po po net positive, net, net negative. And it's, it's an intentional departure from the word value. Um, value becomes very scalar. Everything's on, you know, it can be in the same direction with different magnitudes is often how we think about value. It, it could be representing both valences. But um, often it's a small reward and a big reward or a small punishment and a big punishment is how experimentally we parse um, value. And so valence is just asking about um, how your brain responds to things that are good or bad. What are neurons that might respond similarly to things that are good and bad? You know, those might be importance neurons rather than um, positive or negative valence neurons. So, yeah, I, I think it's a... It's just a term that that signifies that next step. So when we walk into, say, a novel environment, um, do you think that our amygdalas are active and really trying to figure out whether or not an environment, a set of people or a person is safe and really just check that box first in order to be able to do other things? Is You know, is this business of... Um, determining valence and the role of the amygdala in that kind of the first gate that we have to walk through anytime we're in a new environment. For instance, you showed up here today and mm -hmm. you mentioned, you know, I think I locked my car <laughs> and, um, and I said, you'll be fine in this neighborhood either way. And then you walked in and presumably you were taking in the new environment, meeting some new people. Mm -hmm. um, we had a little discussion about caffeine, uh, a little discussion <laughs> about alcohol. And presumably because you and I know one another, you felt safe, I would hope so. Mm -hmm. But presumably the amygdala is always performing this role, even if we have some prior knowledge about something, just figuring out, am mm -hmm. I safe here? Where are the exits? Where are the entrances? Uh, who's here? What's their story? Um, do you think all of that is, is operating? And do you think it's always conscious or is it largely unconscious to us? Okay. So there's a few different questions there. Um, first, I want to address the, the question about novelty. And then I want to come back to this the other issue of conscious. But um, the way the amygdala works is its job is, is to assign meaning to anything that could have motivational significance. And so if it's a brand new thing, we're paying attention. We're seeing if, if, it, if it mattered. Did it matter? And so I think anything that's novel, even if we don't know what it means, a loud sound you've never heard before, um, even if it signifies nothing of motivational significance, the first few times that you're presented with it, you'll get a, an amygdala response. So you see this in the lab, play the tone for the first time, and then there's a response that rapidly decays when the tone doesn't end up predicting anything that the, the animal can can detect. Or human? Is this also yeah, true in humans? Yeah, this is true mm -hmm. in humans. Um, 
if you're the type of person that puts your phone on do not disturb versus has it on vibrate. And, you know, sometimes it's always vibrating and it's just it vibrates all the time. Whereas I put my phone on do not disturb. And so when someone else's phone rings, it's very startling to me. But they're, they don't even notice because their, their phone that's just the sound their phone makes. It makes it all the time. So I think it has to do with how many times you're presented with it. And it's, it's a startle response. So the first few times that you are presented with a stimulus, uh, the amygdala will respond. And then it decays very quickly. And then only if that stimulus predicts something important or something rewarding or, or punishing then uh, will will it begin to respond again? So it's it's like you're giving everything novel a chance to to tell you in one trial, in single trial learning, um, if something's going to happen. And so um, I think a fire alarm is a great example. You know, fire alarm goes off. You're you're instantly you know you're looking around. Is there anything happening? Even even just people rushing out. You know, there's there's the this, this salient thing that you're going to respond to. And, you know, if you have a lot of fire drills, then you might respond differently after a while. So I think that's the habituation component. You mentioned that the amygdala will respond to a novel stimulus. Um, and if it predicts something interesting, then other things happen. We'll talk about those. Um, if not, the amygdala stops responding. And you said something really important, which is that the amygdala will respond to something that is predicting reward or punishment. And I think most people don't realize that. In fact, I think a lot of early career neurobiologists don't realize that, that the amygdala is not just involved in fear and punishment. Um, so when we talk about the amygdala, presumably we're talking about the amygdala complex, a bunch of other things. So is it true that there are neurons in the amygdala complex that predict reward and others that predict fear and punishment? Yeah. So um, as a graduate student, I worked on a part of the amygdala called the basolateral amygdala. It's still a complex within the broader amygdala. Um, this brain region is cortical-like in that it's mostly glutamatergic neurons with some GABAergic neurons mixed in, but without the same structure that the cortex has. Um, and I studied the, the amygdala in the context of reward. I found essentially that when you induce plasticity, you get a synaptic strengthening when you uh, when animals learn things, amygdala neurons fire in response to cues that predict rewards. And this was in, coming into the context of a field that had shown that this happens with fear. And so this became. I, I remember my, the very first time I gave um, a, sci a presentation as, at a scientific conference. I was a junior graduate student. I was given a ten minute talk at the you know, inaugural Amygdala Gordon Research Conference. Many famous professors were speaking, and there were two talks about the amygdala and reward, and I was one of them. And the response to the talk was just, how is this possible? How can how can the amygdala, how can, how can you get the same readout for, for reward and fear? And really, it came to be, there's two, two possibilities. I mean, maybe there's more possibilities, but the main two possibilities are, number one, that the amygdala wasn't specific for fear at all. It just responds to anything important. If it's important, it responds, period. The other possibility is that the amygdala is sending, has different neurons that respond to positive and negative predictive stimuli and sends this information to different downstream targets to respond differently. Obviously, I respond differently to a reward. I walk towards it. I, I consume it. I, a punishment, I'm avoiding it. And so clearly the behaviors are diametrically opposed. And so to me, it seemed very possible, at least, that, that there was a divergence point and maybe this could be it. And so we just did some very simple experiments when I first started my lab to trace the projection targets of amygdala neurons and record. And so everything's all mixed up together. So it's not obvious that, they would, they, that, that, that this would be a, a, a fork in the road, but when you look at them, you do see that there are projections that come from the amygdala that are predominantly encoding either reward or fear. And there's many different projections. And, um, you know, this is just the beginning. But this was a time when it was a novel concept to even think that neurons from one region could have completely different functions going to different downstream targets, which now seems totally obvious. Um, and it, uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of papers showing it now. But at the time, it was difficult to get this work published because that's just not how people thought about 
information moving through the brain, I guess. Well, I think, um, first of all, such important work and so wonderful to be uh, early in the the uh, phase of recasting uh, how the brain works, which is what you did. Um, I think most people in the general public still think amygdala fear. And uh, clearly it's uh, able to signal reward and punishment as you discovered and are now pointing out. Um, I'm curious, does the amygdala have a direct line to some of the organs of the body that can change our bodily activation state? Heart rate, mm -hmm. breathing rate, mm -hmm. um, muscle tension, because I think most of us experience fear and reward as both in our head, in our mm -hmm. brains, but also of the body. Great question, great question. So um, I'll tell you the clues that lead me to my current working model, which may, you know, is not necessarily the final word, but I would say that I think the amygdala complex, as we're discussing it, these 13 subnuclei that reside, you know, in the temporal lobe, they are important for assigning importance, but they're not important for producing the actual autonomic arousal that we associate with panic or fear. The reason I say this is there's a famous case study patient, SM, who have has bilateral damage to her amygdala and um, in, you know, no responses to emotional faces, no responses to fearful stimuli. Um, but if you, if, if capable of having the panic response due to low, to, to suffocation associated with the, with suffocation. And so there's still the ability to produce that panic and arousal response. Um, it's just not the cognitive evaluation of it. I think that's what we think the amygdala is doing is assigning that it, it does receive information from the rest of the body. Um, there are, for example, ghrelin receptors in the amygdala, things that can sense hunger. And um, we've done some some work looking at this, kind of inspired by, I'm, I'm not sure if, this, if you're familiar with this study. Um, it's a controversial study, Danziger 2011, but where the Supreme Court judges, they, they looked at Supreme Court judge rulings on, on parole decisions um, across the day relative to meal breaks. And you can see right after, it's like, it's like breakfast, you know, 90%, everybody's getting parole, everybody's getting out. Yeah, and then it just drops till 10%. Then there's lunch, then we're back to 80%, and then it wow. just precipitously drops to single digits again. So the judges are changing the leniency of their rulings depending on how well-fed they are. You know, there, there are counter arguments to this, but that is strongly what the data suggest. You know, it is not a controlled study. It's just a striking correlation. Um, but it's the it's it's not a, a completely novel concept, the hangry phenomenon. I'm sure, I don't know, everybody's different. I certainly experience it. Um, but we we think that when you are getting strong signals from the body, for example, you know, I think I think the amygdala is going to be able to detect a lot of different homeostatic inputs, even though we haven't we don't have evidence for that yet. But for specifically energy balance, when you're hungry, um, your amygdala can detect it perhaps through ghrelin receptors or other other you know mechanisms, um, and then. What we see is that in that food deprive after one day of food dep deprivation for mice, um, you can see this shift in the balance between the positive valence um, encoding projection neurons and the negative valence encoding projection neurons. And at baseline, fear trumps all. The negative projection neurons, you know, can silence the reward projection ones, which makes sense. If I need to run away from this predator, you know, I can't. I can't worry about eating this food right now. But if I'm in a near starvation like state, which for mice, they have very high metabolism. So one day without food is a really big deal. Um, they only last a few days. So um, at this point, they are kicking into survival mode where actually getting food becomes the the greater need. And you'll see animals, you know, hunting in ways they normally wouldn't hunt when when they're really desperate. And so this mode of, of food deprivation shifts things so that the reward um, – pathway actually be, has stronger power to, mm. to influence and silence the uh, fear pathway than before. Wow, so, the brain is so smart. It really right? is. It can take what we normally think of as a priority list. Like fear and staying safe is more important than food reward. And then if food and acquiring food is critical to survival, it can invert all that. 
is what you're saying. Exactly. Amazing. And it happens, you know, in a day. It seems reversible. So that's something that we're looking at right now and thinking about um, how specific is this this to food? Is this true for lots of different things? What about exercise, other, other stressors that are, you know, d- potentially more positive? The amygdala is able to detect a lot of different signals from the environment. And we're not sure how all of that gets in there. Um, so I think one of the the detection of the environment has been, you know, really well worked out in terms of our basic sensory modalities. But think about the things that really affect your emotions day to day. At least for me, as a human in this society, the things that affect my emotions most day to day are almost entirely social interactions, very subtle ones, ones that don't seem to threaten my life or safety, you know, very small, subtle um, social interactions are, are what, you know, have the greatest bearing, I think, on um, my emotional evaluation and my emotional bandwidth. And what is that? How do we detect that? How do we assemble this information, apply all the nuance, you know, p- put on the onion layers of social programming to come out with whatever, you know, I interpret this gesture to mean? It's it's pretty incredible. And so that's kind of where uh, my research program has, has been sliding. It's such a interesting area. Let's drill into it a bit. Um, and to put it in context, maybe um, talk about social media. Um, so on social media, um, whether or not it's Instagram or X, those are, seem to be the two major platforms. I'm not on TikTok. Um, people say stuff. Sometimes they say positive things. Sometimes mm-hmm. they say, say negative things. Sometimes they say things that are sort of neutral. Mm-hmm. Um, so it seems to me that nowadays, if one is on these social media platforms, that we are um, we've sort of crowdsourced this phenomenon of social interaction in a way that we hadn't before. Because I I grew up prior to the advent of social media, and it, I could bring my physical body into certain environments and not others. Mm-hmm. Even at high school, I could hang out. We had an area called the Bat Cave, mm-hmm. where you know skateboarders and some other at that time misfits hung out. Mm-hmm. We had the quad where the cool kids hung out. Um, Etc. You could you could pick your niche. Mm-hmm. Okay. Social media is not like that. Uh, you can pick followers. They can pick you, etc. But I think since most people have social media nowadays, it seems or are on there in some ways, that we've placed ourselves in the center of an arena, which we have a ton of incoming input. We all, m- most of us, have amygdalas. Two of them, amygdalas. You pointed out one on each side of the brain, and. Presumably, we're on these platforms to receive positive feedback and avoid negative feedback. However, there does seem to be a cohort of people who seem to like the friction of com- combat or kind of, let's just call it high friction interactions or moderate friction interactions. They like to argue. They like to parse ideas. It's not all bad necessarily. Um, so have you ever looked at social media in your, in your own mind, looked at social media through the lens of, of amygdala filtering or through the lens of, of neural circuit filtering and kind of wondered um, what's going on there that someone with without your in-depth knowledge of these brain circuitries would not think to uh, look at that landscape. Hmm. Or maybe we could just do that now as a, yeah. as a, as a kind of playful no, I, experiment. I, I like that. Um, so. A, a lot of people ask me about social media from the context of is this of is this social contact meaningful? Is this positive? Does this count? Does this help you not feel lonely? Um, and of course, I don't know the answer. We haven't done that particular study yet, and I don't I don't know of that specific study having been performed. But my prediction um, is that it's not going to do much because I I believe that a key component of what I would consider social contact heavily depends on having some interbrain synchrony, some interaction in, in, that is synchronous. And I think with social media, sometimes there can be an engaging dialogue that plays out in near real time. But generally speaking, it's asynchronous. You're looking at things that are happened that you're not a part of. You're excluded from all these things. They happened in Australia yeah, yesterday, yeah, yeah. and I'm on there saying, cool, love it. Yeah. And then the person's already asleep. Yes, exactly. So that's what things, you mean by asynchronous. Things, asynchronous okay. like Got that. It. We're not yeah. experiencing things at the same time. It's not a shared 
experience, you know, that in, in terms of that having that bond necessarily. And so I've never actually been asked about how the amygdala process is social media. Um, I guess I think what happens is, you know, the amygdala is just responding to stimuli. It's sending up bottom-up signals. You know, it's a caricature of, of um, bottom-up and top-down processing. Let's give an example that I'm, I'm walking down the street and all of a sudden I hear like a really ferocious dog barking at me, rah, 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 all going crazy. And then I get super scared. And then I realize, okay, there's a fence. So the amygdala detect, you know, heard the dog barking. Hey, there's a dog barking. And, you know, I'm, I'm freaking out. Then my prefrontal cortex realizes there's the fence and it looks very sturdy. This fence looks stable. And then I'm relaxing and I'm resuming my walking normally. You know, I think that's sort of the dance that our brain is doing when we have top down and bottom up uh, information that we're trying to stay focused. So for me, I think when I'm on social media, there's so many stimuli that that are evoking responses. And um, to be completely transparent, and I know this is not something that everybody else does or can do or is necessarily what's best for them. But I work very hard to control input from the top down um, in terms of I really, really limit the amount. I, I basically don't check email or go on social media. I would say I'm on social media or email less than one hour per week, basically. Per week? Per week. All per, I have to say to per, that is per, congratulations. <laughs> we'll talk about social media again in a second, but as a fellow professor <laughs> – Email once a week. I've heard of people scheduling their times for email responses, but once a week, that is awesome. I have no people wonder who you're help, so productive. I have people who help me get through it no and then and, so and filter out what's important. But oh otherwise, I just whenever I do my own email, I say yes to all these things. Then I make all these plans, and then I'm and then I'm, I have too many trips, and I'm responding fra fragmented, fragmented, and it's just you know overcommitting. And I think um, I know my limits. Sometimes it's difficult for me to be in my amygdala mode, responding to stimuli and yet letting my prefrontal cortex do its thing. So I've set some very heavy prefrontal cortically selected limits of the input I put in so that my brain can function and be clear. I can't be creative. I can't have epiphanies if there's all this clutter of like writing this person back and blah, 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 tweet, tweet. Ugh, it's just, you know, I get love the trash it. out. Wipe, squeegee, squeegee the brain down <laughs> so that we can actually grow something beautiful and new. Well, and I want to reemphasize what I said in my introduction, which is that, I mean, you are oh so productive. And when I say productive, I don't just mean productive like plug and chug. You, you, the work you've done is incredibly creative. You transformed our understanding of what this famous structure, the amygdala, actually does. I mean, you've made so many important discoveries as a consequence of presumably other things, but including wiping away all this incoming and clutter, as you said, controlling the top-down inputs. I have to ask, just from a practical standpoint, during that one hour a week, are you reading every email that came in or are you just being very selective about which oh, emails? No, no, no. So you're not opening most emails. No, I don't open most emails. No, I just, I search for the ones that my assistant identifies as the one I need to open. There's like a list of things that I'd be interested in and then we'll go through the list and then you know, sometimes it requires me to go and find the email and respond to it myself because it, that is, and then I would do that for, te, you know, 10, 10 minutes a day or something. Do you recommend- just get out of there as soon as I can. I love it. <laughs> do, um, do you pass on this advice to the people that you train? I think it depends on what resources and what's your, what's the, what's your job right now, right? So I think um, as a trainee, I definitely did my, as an assistant professor, I did my own emails, but at a certain point, um, I was just never getting to the bottom. And then it would just stress me out, make me feel overwhelmed. And what is my job? My job is to, number one, be a stable core of a sustainable research program. And um, that just requires me having a lot of mental health and well-being and, um, and, and clear-mindedness. And I need to be able to come up with creative ideas. I need to be able to sprint when there's a deadline and I, I just can't exhaust my system with unnecessary, I would call them quadrant four in the time management quadrant, if you're familiar with this, you know. Oh yeah, what is it? It's uh, important, urgent. Yes. Certain important, things, are urgent, right. things are urgent, but not important. Some things are urgent and some things are neither important nor urgent. Right. That's right. most emails are, are in, 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 like, if you read time management literature and you have the luxury to have someone else help you 
or something that's like so well trained to be really good at capturing kept- kept- things that are important. And, you know, sometimes I miss emails, but emails are not the way my trainees would reach me. They would reach me in a different way. Um, and then emails are for everyone else that I didn't give my number to, you know. <laughs> I feel so honored to have, it, have your contact. I'd like to take a brief moment and thank one of our sponsors, and that's AG1. AG1 is a vitamin mineral probiotic drink that also contains adaptogens. I started taking AG1 way back in 2012. The reason I started taking it and the reason I still take it every day is that it ensures that I meet all of my quotas for vitamins and minerals. And it ensures that I get enough prebiotic and probiotic to support gut health. Now, gut health is something that over the last 10 years, we realized is not just important for the health of our gut, but also for our immune system and for the production of neurotransmitters and neuromodulators, things like dopamine and serotonin. In other words, gut health is critical for proper brain functioning. Now, of course, I strive to consume healthy whole foods for the majority of my nutritional intake every single day, but there are a number of things in AG1, including specific micronutrients that are hard to get from whole foods or at least in sufficient quantities. So AG1 allows me to get the vitamins and minerals that I need, probiotics, prebiotics, the adaptogens, and critical micronutrients. So anytime somebody asks me if they were to take just one supplement, what that supplement should be, I tell them AG1, because AG1 supports so many different systems within the body that are involved in mental health, physical health, and performance. To try AG1, go to drinkag1.com slash Huberman, and you'll get a year's supply of vitamin D3 K2 and five free travel packs of AG1. Again, that's drinkag1.com slash Huberman. I think this is wonderful advice for people to hear um, we have a future guest on this podcast named Cal Newport. He wrote the book Deep Work, and he has another book called The World Without Email. He's a computer oh. science professor at Georgetown where he, he talks extensively about the tremendous career, but also relationship and life value of doing essentially what you're describing. Although I do think, Kay, that you represent kind of the extreme of what I've um, become aware of in terms of people that can limit the amount of time on uh, social media platforms and email. Anyway, I just want to say um, congratulations. I just want to say that again. And I think it, <laughs> even if people don't reduce to one hour per week, I think that making some effort toward reducing the amount of incoming, as you said, controlling the top-down inputs mm-hmm. to the amygdala, but also to the rest of the brain involved in creative processing, et cetera, is so key. And we actually do have agency. It's just is, it's, it's tough um, sometimes to build up that discipline. So- uh, you're doing a tremendous service by sharing that somebody as successful as you does this, presumably is successful in part because you do this. Could we, by extension, say that many people, since billions of people are on social media, are likely um, triggering the activation of their amygdala, clouding out other more potentially productive activation of their neural circuits by sort of just making themselves freely available to the to – the, uh, thoughts and words and impulses of others? I mean, to me, it seems the answer would be yes, but I'd like to know what you think. I mean, I think, um, and there's something to be said. There's definitely been moments where I've, I've, you know, gone deep into social media and spent more time in a certain burst, right, that is isolated. And I think that there's a lot to be learned from social media. So to actually, to bring it back to one point you mentioned earlier, um, on social media, sometimes people just want accolades and sometimes there's a lot of, of, friction. One of the reasons I stay on social media, even though I'm making this big effort to sort of declutter my consciousness, is because of that feedback. Especially when, you know, for for someone like you, I I imagine this has got to be super true. And even for me at, at a certain point in my career, it just felt like people don't want to tell me bad news to my face as much anymore. Everybody's so positive all the time. And you know, what they, what are they really thinking? Mm -hmm. And social media allows you the protection of anonymity to say what you really think without um, consequence, essentially. And so on the one hand, the consequence free um, nature of being able to just say things can be very dangerous. But at the same time, for me, I really value just being able to receive it. I'm, you know, I'm a big girl. I can filter out what I want when I get all the inputs. But if I don't receive the inputs, sometimes it's hard to learn from the feedback I'm not getting. So even sometimes feedback's given in a not very nice way, I can still 
create a model for someone else that has this perspective that I can take with me and that can be another perspective I can honor easily in the future because I have this theory of mind for someone, some, oh, someone would get upset about that. Uh, you know, that's something that could be harmful to people who are, you know, have this theory of mind. So I think it's super valuable from that perspective. And that's why I continue to use it. Great. Yeah. I, I really applaud that as well. I, I always read my teaching evals because they're anonymous and yes, I do wonder, you know, what grade the different uh, people who gave different evals, you know, got, I don't know that information. Mm -hmm. I sometimes wonder, do they attend the class or are they just angry they didn't do well on the exam? But that really represents the small fraction of feedback that I'm, um, that I wonder about. Most of it um, that's valuable to me is the, hey, you know, liked the course, but these parts really sucked, mm -hmm. Professor Huberman, or mm -hmm. this part was completely unclear, or completely hated the way you blank, blank, and blanked. Mm -hmm. Because that feedback is something I can really work with to improve. So I think mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. course evals are, are similar to what you're describing. I think there's value there. If I were to just look at the, the positive feedback and then ignore the negative feedback and not write those people off, then I don't think I could improve as a teacher. Actually, I always encourage comments and feedback and suggestions in the YouTube comments for this podcast mm -hmm. for that reason. And I do read the comments. I go through and I read and um, a few of them sting. Um, yeah. But, you know, the positive feedback is great too. Sometimes it's more of this, please. Yep. Or less of that, please. Yep. I think there, there's information in that. Yeah. Um, so I think it sounds like you've been doing all of these things naturally. I, so so actually, I, in, uh, since I've had my research group, my, my lab, um, we do an anonymous lab survey every – it's supposed to be about every 18 months. And then it's a whole long process of going through it. And it's just evolved. It's, I think it's the like fourth or fifth time we've done it. And so it's now – I think it's like 70 questions. It's so many questions. We got, maybe we should we should trim it down. But it, it ends up being hundreds of pages of of text, you know, short answer, sometimes long answer, feedback from anonymously from people in my lab. My lab is pretty big. So it's, it's you know, I'm, I'm not even trying to really guess who is saying it. It's just feedback. And it takes me months to go through with it and, and get all the feedback. And it is so useful. I mean, in a class, the 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 amount of contact that you have is it's it's restricted to this very specific time and space whereas when you're mentoring someone over the cross course of years there's a lot of different there's a lot of different points of of contact and interaction and you know you're in the lab all 40 hours a week or whatever and you know going trip meeting here there's just a lot of different different ways to improve in ways that we've never you know I've, I haven't had any training in how to be a really great mentor. And so I'm getting that training now. I'm making my own course and my mentees are my teachers. And um, I really am grateful for the the tutelage that they provide for free in this anonymous lab survey. Sometimes it makes me cry, but sometimes it makes me feel really good about something that I'm doing that's working. And in any case, it makes me feel that I have ground truth. I guess I still don't know. But when people say things that sting, um, it makes me feel like they're saying what they really think and they're not holding back. It doesn't, you know, and um, bad news feels like reality. And so that is very, something about that is rewarding um, just to feel like I have reality rather than I'm getting something else, you know, that the model doesn't quite fit. It's very unsatisfying when the model doesn't quite fit. So I love the word ground truth. There's something so beautiful <laughs> to that. And I, I resonate with um, what you're saying. Let's go back to social interaction, mm -hmm. something that your lab is doing um, lots of work on nowadays. Mm -hmm. And maybe we could shift to the sorts of social interaction that most of us are familiar with. The um, sitting across the table, having a coffee with somebody, the taking a walk with somebody, mm -hmm. maybe a phone call, yeah, um, maybe a tough conversation, um, maybe a playful, you know, um, you know, unscripted conversation. Um, maybe a meal at a holiday dinner. You know, there's a huge range there. What what do we know about the value of social interaction at the level of sort of core biological needs, like at the level of neural circuits and maybe even hormones? I mean, you know, most people have heard of oxytocin. They think the love hormone, but it's there's so much more there for people to understand and know about. You know, how important is this thing that we call social interaction? 
and how bad do things get when we're not getting the right kinds of social interaction? You know, I think this is this is a great question, and I'm glad that it's become something that has been recognized at a more global and national scale. Just the importance of of having social support in our lives for help for our well being, um, but social isolation or even just perceived loneliness has immense health consequences for all social species. So um, shortened lifespan, increased mood disorders, um, increased actually morbidity and mortality for diseases like cancer or heart disease that, you know, um, might not be what we would normally think. And so I think understanding how each of those processes is happening, those mechanisms are far from being worked out. But the the correlational evidence is undeniable. We're now taking this into the lab really for the first time. And so something so simple as social isolation, how come we don't know way more about it? And um, I'm someone who stumbled into the field of social isolation by accident prior to the pandemic. And so I'll just say, you know, the whole story on why there's such a gaping hole in our knowledge as a neuroscience community about social isolation really comes from Harry Harlow's work, this original work of maternal separation that was undeniably cruel. It, it caused irreparable damage to these baby monkeys, and they never recovered. And uh, sorry to interrupt. Sorry, I yeah. apologize. I'm just striving to not interrupt in my life, but I but no, so please. that people are on on board. Um, could you just briefly describe the Harlow experiment? Yes. So. They're very famous experiments where they separated uh, baby monkeys from their moms and then had either a wire sort of thing holding a bottle. So, okay, what did, what do you miss most about the mom? Is it the wire? Is it the food or is it the, the, the comfort? And then they had – so they had a wire thing with, with a milk bottle versus, you know, blankets and cu cuddly soft things. And, and the, the baby monkeys would go to the cuddly soft thing. But, you know – a blanket is not a replacement for a mother. Nobody's saying that it is. And and through these experiments, there was extended maternal separation, and it's it's it was deemed cruel. Um, there was permanent irreparable damage when you when you rehouse these monkeys. They never resocialized normally. They had lots of different mental and physical health problems. Um, and I think in humans, we know that so, you know solitary confinement is considered torture. Um, you know, social isolation is a difficult thing to study in, in a lot of conditions. And we stumbled onto it by complete accident through working with a postdoc, a former postdoc in my lab, Jillian Matthews, who was a graduate student um, doing an experiment on, on, it was just trying to figure out if these dopamine neurons um, would also respond to cocaine the way VT8, these, sorry, these ventral tegmental area dopamine neurons were known to respond to cocaine. Wanted to see if these other dopamine neurons respond to cocaine. So sort of a incremental study. So when you do these cocaine studies, you you inject the animal with cocaine or saline and then leave the naive animal in the cage. And then you take brain slices, record from the neurons, and look at the synaptic strengths. And so, you know, the expected outcome sort of was that these dopamine neurons would, would be similar to other dopamine neurons that showed in, you know, long-lasting potentiation after a single dose of cocaine. But... What happened instead was that, yes, there was potentiation in the cocaine animals. There's also potentiation in the saline animals relative to the naive group. And this was a huge puzzle. What was this? And it turned out through many, many different experiments um, that it's actually because when you inject animals with cocaine, you're separating them from the group because they, they act all crazy. And this is just what, the way people do the experiment. So you inject them with saline, you separate them. The naive animals just stay there. So with their other with litter their mates. other mates. I see. So the control group, the saline right. control group, is actually a social isolation condition. So by accident, this control group that didn't make sense was how we stumbled onto. So then we tried. Is it novel cage? It's not the novel cage. It's the it's the social isolation. And so um, that is how we became a lab that studied social isolation. It was a complete accident. We weren't sure what what we were looking at. And then um, we we found these neurons and we manipulated these neurons and they produced um, something very different than 
other dopamine neurons, which normally if you stimulate dopamine neurons, these ventral tegmental area, midbrain dopamine neurons, like 90% of the time when you, you hear people talk about dopamine neurons, they mean these ones. And they're the ones where you press the lever, stimulate the neurons, we'll press the lever thousands of times, you know. And if They you, love to be stimulated. Yes. And yeah. if, if you're a human and you do cocaine, you, you most people love cocaine. They, they want, they're very pro-social when they're okay on cocaine. And so that's what dopamine neurons were thought to be do doing. But these other dopamine neurons in the dorsal raphe that I will also say is in the brainstem near to an aqueduct where you could detect signals from the body. Um, but these other dopamine neurons in the raphe they, when you stimulate them, animals don't like it. They will not work for reward. They actually will move away from a space that's where they're being stimulated, you know, conditioned place and real-time place aversion. I don't like the feeling of these neurons being activated. Please stop it. And yet they would be pro-social. And so for a long time, this was super confusing. We couldn't understand it. And then just because at the same time we had a, um, a, a hunger study going on in the lab, we just thought about it like... I can eat food because it's delicious and I I want to eat this yummy treat or I can eat because I'm super hungry. I feel shaky. I'm just going to eat this nasty fiber bar out of my backpack because I'm so desperate and I need like, I need my, my blood sugar is dangerously low, you know? And so there's two reasons that you can eat and one of them is uncomfortable. Hunger is not comfortable. You don't, it's not a good feeling to be hungry. And so we thought about this and that's kind of how we circularly came around to thinking, I think we've discovered the loneliness neurons, essentially. And so what is loneliness? And loneliness is this unpleasant need state of wanting social contact that would have this pro-social effect as well. And so um, that's basically the very serendipitous loop-de-loop -loop way that I came to be um, uh, studying how loneliness is represented in the brain. Amazing. Before we talk a bit more about these loneliness neurons and some of their inputs and outputs in the brain. Um, how has the discovery of these neurons um, perhaps changed the way that you organize your day and week in life, right? Um, if at all. Um, for instance, are you more aware of how much time you spend alone versus with others? Are you um, more careful or discerning about who you spend your time with. Um, you know, I, I ask this um, because, you know, there's so many examples for me in the neuroscience literature where, you know, I learned something new about how the brain works. And I think, oh, yeah, you know, it makes a lot of sense why my sleep isn't great. You know, it turns out that light exposure to the eyes at particular times of day really sets the whole body and brain into particular rhythms that you know, explain why I was a little depressed when I was in graduate school, staying up all night doing experiments, and I'd sleep much of the day and feel f like I was getting eight, nine hours. I don't get eight to nine hours now, but, um, you know, and when I wake up early, for me personally, there's a bit of an antidepressant effect mm -hmm. as long as I slept the night before. Seasonal you know? affect disorder is real. Right. So, you know, I think as new information comes online, um, at least for me, it's it's changed the way that I organize my life to, to su in subtle yeah. or, or in not so subtle ways. So the idea that there are neurons in the brain that encode loneliness, the absence of social contact, does that have you thinking, you know, after a few days of managing the lab uh, with, which as you point out, you have a very large lab, lots of social interaction, but it's work context social interaction. Does that, um, has that led you to think, hey, you know, we should go out to dinner as a lab or I should spend time with somebody who's not in science? Um, or I should spend time by myself because I've had too much social interaction. I'm not asking for strict protocols here. I'm just wondering if you're willing to get, um, like play in the sandbox of this with me a bit. Yeah. Um, how this information perhaps has shaped some of your choices, you personally. And, yeah. and, and, and to be very clear, I'm not asking you to dictate what mm -hmm. other people no, do. No, of course. Um, has it changed your social life? So it's really interesting that you ask this question. And now that you, for, you know, now that you're asking it this way, um, I, I mean, of course, when I learn new things, I, 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 um, take them and implement them into my life. But to be honest in, in the cycle of, of, you know, learning and studying and being curious. And I actually think where I reside more is when something's going on with me, 
my research program, you know, research is me search. It becomes what the re- it dictates what the research program evolves into. And so, for example, for example, so I was, just had started studying loneliness um, a few years before the pandemic hit, and then the pandemic hit, and it was just a step function like change. I went from I'm never alone unless you call being in an Uber alone um, or being on a plane. And, and, and just, you know, constantly people in my office, even when I'm going to the bathroom, someone's waiting for me outside. Like, you know, I'm not, it's like I'm hurrying in the bathroom. I'm never alone. There's like four people in my bed kicking me in the face. I'm just, you know, there's just so much social conduct. And then boom, you know, there would be a day. I wouldn't see another, like, you know, just the, a, a, not zero, but just extremely sudden drop of social contact when there's no more work. And, you know, it was just that, that period of time. And it was, it was very depressing. It was just this huge, I felt like I was in free fall and it made me, you know, at first it was really disruptive and I was worried about myself, you know? And then at some point I adjusted to it and then I got used to working from home. I got started a garden. Like I got, you know, I, I got, you know, I just started a different life pattern that, involved a lot of alone time and, you know, something, uh, an alone time personal life grew where there wasn't any space for anything to grow before. And then I became comfortable with it. And so then I started thinking about that that's really where the idea of social homeostasis was born. This idea that, okay, why is it with acute social isolation, humans, monkeys, mice, you know, you acutely isolate the individual from the social group, you reintroduce them to the social group, rebound of pro-social interaction. Oh, so happy to see you. There's like all these affiliative interactions, a a burst of affiliative interactions. Whereas with chronic social isolation in humans, monkeys, mice, even flies, you reintroduce them to the social group and you get territorial behavior, aggression, avoidance, antisocial behavior, um, or just, you know, sort of a very different negative valence response to the exposure to the group. And so this, maybe people brushed it off for a long time as just, oh, it's confusing. This literature is inconsistent. Or maybe there's one model that makes it all make sense. That is social homo- homeostasis where, you know, you're used to getting this at a certain point. And so my effector system gets activated I, I detect that I'm alone. It's I want more. The deficit's detected. Then my effector systems gets activated. This and then I start spinning all the systems that try to get me back into contact. I'm calling my friends. I'm texting my friend. I'm I'm if I'm a mouse, I'm making ultrasonic vocalizations. I'm exploring outside of the burrow. And then you know, if my friends don't call me back, they're like, sorry, we don't want to see anyone till end of COVID. Bye. You know, whatever it is, you know, you, the, it's it's not working. My correction efforts are failing, or maybe a certain amount of time. We don't know. Then I give up. I stop. I stop calling. I stop going out. I just make a different life. You know, you, you the 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 don't you don't leave the burrow. Whatever it is, and there's in in animals and humans, at least behaviorally, there's a near step function like drop off of attempts to you know you can see it sort of date. Oh, then they just give up on dating after this one. You know, whatever happens, there's some some straw that breaks the camel's back, and then this person doesn't want to date anymore or doesn't want to go out anymore. Whatever. And and what is that? So that adaptation, then you're at a new baseline. You're you're expecting now your new normal. I'm I'm expecting to have a gardening day at home alone, not see anyone. And then and then a bunch of people come over. It feels like a surplus. So my previous optimum, re, re, you know, reintroduction to the social group, is now feeling like a surplus, an overload, overstimulated. And that's I think something that a lot of people experience this whiplash of going into the, the pandemic and coming out of it. Different people to different levels. It depends on how much you, you know, isolated while you were uh, in the pandemic. But I think thinking about um, your social set point as being flexible and dynamic was a new concept to me. And then in my mind, the question is, what is the part of this process that is causing all these harmful health consequences like shortened lifespan, mood disorders, et cetera. Is it the initial detection that I'm missing something and effector system activation? Because if that was the case, maybe I want to band-aid that. You know, maybe I want to get get a pet, get a get a get a Zoom buddy. I don't know. What you know, you would have different prescriptions and ad- advice to give people if that were the case. Versus you would give almost opposite advice if the thing that's causing it is the 
the set point adaptation. Then you want to you want to stave it off versus if you wanted to accelerate getting into the set point. Which is better? You know, is it the adaptation or is it, you know, kind of trying to fix it? And so in one case, you would want to ease off the the having the set point happen, the set point transition happen. In the other case, rip it off like a band-aid, cold turkey, just adjust, and then you'll be fine. You know, then you won't worry about it. Then you won't be lonely anymore because you'll just be comfortable being alone. You know, people talk about cognitive flexibility. Um, and I think it's it's sort of like that, but it's social flexibility. I want to be able to be alone. I also want to be able to be in a large group and be comfortable. And so I think what I've done, if anything, to change my lifestyle um, to accommodate these new insights I've had is is to consciously create dynamic social experiences. Lots of social experiences, yes, but also protecting alone time, which I never did before. I just I just, just, just gave it all away. And, you know, I realized that having that just made my social homeostatic system feel more elastic and flexible and resilient and less like a crisis if something, you know, I'm, I'm very comfortable being alone. I'm super comfortable in my own skin now. And it requires investing in that relationship. I like how you framed uh, earlier, I, th I think we were not not recording yet, but the relationship with yourself as being a very important relationship. And um, when I think about brain states, you know, we don't know this yet, but my working model would be that different individuals, we represent their identities, and whenever they're present, it creates a unique ensemble of that combination of people being present and being alone is also a unique state that cannot be achieved. I have the brain state of being alone. I cannot achieve it if anyone else is around. And that's just what, you know, that's kind of the working model I have. I think what you're saying is uh, essential for people to hear because um, it makes sense that loneliness would hurt. Um, it makes sense that some people are more extroverted, which I think is defined as uh, getting energy from social interactions and resetting energy through social interactions as opposed to introverted, which by the way, folks, introverts like myself do enjoy social interaction. It's just that we reset through more um, solo or one-on-one -on -one time than we do in larger groups. That's my understanding of the introversion, extroversion literature. We can revisit that. But this notion of social homeostasis is, I think, so key. Uh, important enough that I think we probably want to redefine it um, as many times or restate it rather as many times as is necessary because I believe what you're describing is the same thing that one would experience with food. If we eat a lot, we're consuming 3,500 calories a day and then um, suddenly we only have access to 1,800 calories a day. There's It feels like a deficit because indeed it is. Whereas after some period of time at 1,800 calories a day, 2,200 calories a day feels like relative abundance, relative abundance. Um, when the pandemic hit, I certainly um, was unhappy about the state of affairs in the world, of course. Um, but I recall feeling like, oh my goodness, I finally don't have to commute 90 minutes in each direction to Stanford because I lived in the East Bay at that time. Um, I felt like I had time to do things I hadn't done in a long time. And uh, thanks to Zoom, I was able to get certain things done, not others. Then after about six to eight months, when I realized that this is going to carry on for a while, I remember feeling quite lonely and making some efforts to repair that. I, I think social media, not to harp on social media, um, could do either one of two things, and I don't know which, in the context of uh, social homeostasis. Either going on Instagram and seeing a lot of familiar faces and comments and accounts could make me feel like I'm getting some social interaction such that then when I close that app, and move to my work at my desk or something, uh, which these days is mostly done um, solo, um, that I would feel like I had social interaction. Or perhaps it's the equivalent of um, calories that um, then makes me feel more isolated when I'm not in the app. Perhaps. I find it to be distinctly different than like the experience I had last night of going to dinner with someone I know quite well, sitting down and having a open-ended conversation and deciding to close out the night only when we realized, you know, we got to get up tomorrow for work. So went our separate ways. Um, there's something that felt very sating about it. So I wonder in this context of social homeostasis, whether or not the analogy of 
social interaction to cal caloric intake. If we could, is there another dimension to it where it's not just the total number of calories or the total amount of social interaction, but the quality of social interaction, the type of social interaction that actually feels like nourishment as opposed to just calories? I love where you're going with this. And, and so um, when we wrote this review the first time, we, you know, we were, we were conceptualizing this idea of of how your social set point can change based on if, if you're acutely isolated or, or chronically isolated. And um, the y-axis is the quality slash quantity of detected social contact, which is so fuzzy. And, you know, there's it's it's, again, one of the most challenging frontiers of this field because how even if we measured every single p component that the brain can detect of the social the social contact so much of it is about expectation you know like if i think i got a gesture if if i get a nod from the president i'm like oh my god did the president just nod at me that's so exciting versus if i get a nod from my partner i'm like oh my god are they mad at me what's going on why why did i just get a nod right it totally matters the gesture you need the identity there's many different cognitive systems that need to all plug in to this wheel um, to make it spin. So I think that uh, that is one of the, the I, I think that's gonna keep us busy for a while. But in terms of your question about social media and when you switch from, you know, getting social media feedback and then doing work, um, I, think, I think it really depends. I mean, social media is such a large category. You can have many different types of responses Generally, I think the bounds, so you know, when you say social media versus a real life interaction where you're with someone, maybe you're touching, maybe you're not touching, but even if you're just having conversation, um, you have interbrain synchrony. You are um, having a lot of interbrain synchrony. You're in the same place, if, if, but you can have interbrain synchrony even on the phone, right? Just a voice call is actually a lot more interbrain synchrony than than messages. I think I think text messages can bring a lot of anxiety and there's been a lot of commentary about that. Um, and same thing with 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 social media. I think the, the thing about social media that is perhaps um, the most n harmful or net negative, I think t in terms of I, when I'm thinking about social nourishment, if I, you know, sort of making that term up on the fly here, but um, it's, it's almost a withdrawal. When social media is posted, it's not to you, it's to everyone. And you could be one of the people that receives this message, but it's not even like to you. I'm not even talking to you. And I'm doing something that's without you. Otherwise you'd be in this picture and not reading on social media, listening to whatever. So it's like by almost exclusively, you're, you're posting about activities that you're being excluded from and someone's not even really talking to you unless they're DM, you know, direct messaging you. But then I, call, I kind of consider that a different category if it's like a one-to-one -one communication. Social media to me is, is a blast, right? It's not, it's just, you know, catching up with someone on social media. I, I don't really see the merit of it because I'll just catch up with them when I catch up with them and their kids will just be like way older. But, you know, I don't know. I'll actually really catch up with them than just see pictures of, you know, I don't know. I, I feel mixed about it because it's not a real connection and it doesn't for me sate my social appetite to catch up with, to, to look at someone else's profile on, on social media. Um, that doesn't actually do anything for the the connection. I, I don't know, but I seriously doubt tons of oxytocin is released when I, you know, follow someone's feed about their vacation. So I don't know. I would, I think that it definitely matters the quality and Social media is is different than real life interactions for many reasons. I'd like to take a quick break and thank our sponsor, Inside Tracker. Inside Tracker is a personalized nutrition platform that analyzes data from your blood and DNA to help you better understand your body and help you reach your health goals. I've long been a believer in getting regular blood work done for the simple reason that many of the factors that impact your immediate and long-term health can only be analyzed from a quality blood test. 
Now, a major problem with a lot of blood tests out there, however, is that you get information back about metabolic factors, lipids and hormones and so forth, but you don't know what to do with that information. With Inside Tracker, they make it very easy because they have a personalized platform that allows you to see the levels of all those things, metabolic factors, lipids, hormones, et cetera, but it gives you specific directives that you can follow that relate to nutrition, behavioral modification, supplements, et cetera, that can help you bring those numbers into the ranges that are optimal for you. If you'd like to try Inside Tracker, you can go to insidetracker.com slash Huberman to get 20% off any of Inside Tracker's plans. Again, that's insidetracker.com slash Huberman. I really appreciate your willingness to uh, explore in this, uh, in this context. I think your mention of the fact that um, real life interaction involves interbrain synchrony could be by text, scaling up from that by phone, um, FaceTime or something akin to that video video chat um on social media there is comments back and forth um although that's time consuming and it's difficult because there's anonymity people are in different places mm -hmm. different time zones mm -hmm. if you don't know someone it's different context mm -hmm. um so i'm really thanks to what you're describing i'm really starting to think about social media as so different than in-person social interactions or by phone or video chat social interactions and how those would differentially impact social homeostasis. And it's leading me at least to conclude that at least for me, that most social media interactions would create more hunger mm -hmm. as opposed to a um, sating of, of the need for social interaction. It's, um, I have to be careful with the analogies here, but yes. since I can do this, I, I was almost <laughs> gonna make an analogy between um, porn, pornography uh -huh. In-person sexual intimacy. Uh -huh. I suppose there's something in between where people could talk by phone, but uh -huh. we don't want to explore this in any kind of salacious <laughs> way. And then um, sexual intimacy with with uh, with emotion, with mm -hmm. positive emotion, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Those, mm -hmm. There's a scaling factor there. Yeah. And I'm not pa I'm not putting um, judgment or valence. Uh -huh. I'm I'm certainly not. That's not my place. As a good friend of mine says, I'm not a cop. You know, I'm not telling people what to do. They can't do. <laughs> but it's so interesting to think about these. Um, these circuits within us that create these, what you and I in our field call appetitive, the desire for or mm -hmm. aversive, the desire to move away from type responses and how so much of our life, aside from you, because you're regulating your social media and your, uh, and your email intake, but so much of life now is offering us the opportunity to um, tickle these circuits or even hit them hard with a sledgehammer. But we're not thinking about these homeostatic mechanisms of whether or not they're creating more hunger for mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. more satisfaction from. Yeah. And I, I I cannot emphasize enough how critical this is. And I think that's because, you know, I'm somebody who does spend a fair amount of time on social media. A lot yeah. of my, my work exists on social media, YouTube, et cetera. And I would hope that the work that we're putting into the world with this podcast is creating a, a satiation or the desire for information rather than a hunger for more. I do hope that. But I recognize that educational material on social media represents the, the a tiny, tiny fraction of what's there. So social homeostasis, I think, is a term that if people haven't already stamped into their mind, they should be stamping into their mind. And, and Dr. K. Tai deserves credit for that. I don't, uh, I will say that, so you don't have to. Um, I've heard you say before, you wrote in a review, something akin to social contact is either positive or negative when it's deficient or in excess, which is, I think, what you're mm -hmm. describing is, is social homeostasis. Is that right? When we talked about the quality and quantity, um, there's just in terms of contact, just amount of contact, there's such a thing as just the right amount. There's such a thing as too little. There's such a thing as too much. There's overcrowding, right? It doesn't matter who it is. It could be your family. It could just sometimes it's like a lot. Maybe and your family. Depends. depends. Do, you know the, do you know the famous Ram Das quote? <laughs> no. Think you're enlightened? Go spend a weekend with your parents. <laughs> <laughs> no, no disrespect, mom and dad. I know, right? Um, but um, I think with quality, it matters so much. Like I was sort of saying before, you know, the same gesture from the president or my partner, it's going to feel very different to me, whether that was a slight or, uh, you know, it's just, it's relative to what is appropriate for our rank, for our prior history of relationships for you know the the environmental context and so i think with social media in general and i agree social media is great for a lot of things i mean 
I and I, I I think that having a podcast like this that is accessible to the public makes research more sustainable. So I have a lot of things to say about science communication that I'm very, you know, grateful for. But in terms of social media, think about the mutual investment. When you are interacting with someone on social media, what are they investing in this connection? So if I put out a post about my vacation that is public, I'm investing 0.000000001% of my bandwidth to make contact with you. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it's, it's, it scales up from them. If, if you're making a voice call with someone, you're giving them at least most of your attention for the time that you're on the call. That's a lot, right? Whereas, you know, so, so just thinking about the investment is another component. There's the real time component and then there's the, the investment component. Who is it coming from? It matters. If you're anonymous, I really, I cannot tell what this means. You know, a compliment from an, or, or a hate, hate comment or a love comment from an anonymous person. I don't know what to do with this. You know, like, I just literally don't know how to, you know, it doesn't really, it doesn't really do anything for me because I don't know how to interpret it. It's almost, you know, uninterpretable without this other dimension that my brain is, has evolved to look for, I think. So that's, you know, speculation. But I think social media is, is operating in a way that, that is not ethological and not designed to make us feel better. It's just designed to make us want to use it. And I think a lot of this comes down to things that are relative. You know, there's the famous, um, there's the famous observations. If, if a mon monkey sees another monkey get a cucumber, it's happy with the cucumber. But if a monkey sees the other monkey get grape, monkey wants grape. You know, you want you want to keep up with the Joneses. You want what if you see someone else having something? You, suddenly, it feels like a loss that you don't have it that you didn't even think that of this thing that you needed, right? And so I think social media is exposing you to a lot of things that you don't, you know, that it's it's like this this parameter space you didn't have. There's all these things you didn't know you were missing that you didn't need to miss out on. And so we have this whole project now. We have two projects, one that's looking at social isolation and following what happens with social isolation across the time course to try to understand, is it the amount of time or is it the amount of effort that you put into correcting that deficit um, that that makes you leads you to the giving up, you know, kind of state change. And another project that um, is about the quality of social contact, specifically social exclusion. So a different kind of deficit. You're with your other animals, but there's this this you, you know it's four animals that have our, um, our cage mates, and um, three animals are on one side able to drink a chocolate milkshake, and the other animals. Ex excluded and this one excluded animal will go up against the the divider and and you know look look frantic and you know ex exhibit lots of behaviors that we would associate in humans with fear of missing out trying to reunite with the group trying to get the attention of the group trying to get over there a lot of attending looks frantic and studying what we think is actually going on and so i think that i think coming up with paradigms to try to probe social isolation and we don't even know what behaviors animals exhibit when they're lonely. This is this is a, a challenging field because there's no number of lever presses. You know, there's no there's no script to follow and there's no trial structure. And so for a neuroscientist, neuroscientists were trained to be rigorous about our statistics because of the stochastic nature of neural neural activity and you know, how do we process things without a trial structure? How do we be statistically rigorous when the animal is just free floating, deciding whatever it wants to do. And so that is kind of the crucible that my lab is is working through right now to establish pipelines and techniques and ways to quantify social behaviors and peel off all the layers. I love where your lab is headed, which just means we're going to have to have you back on here again at some point in the future to get the answers to those questions that you're now addressing. I've long thought that uh, we really know how we feel about somebody when something good happens to them or for them. And I never quite understood this at the level of mechanisms. How could I? It's not what my lab studies. But, you know, I think that there's a natural sort of empathy if one is a healthy, uh, empathic person to seeing a member of our own species and hopefully uh, also to the 
observing the members of other species, um, you know, experiencing some discomfort. We don't like that, nor should we. So another human is in emotional pain, right? Um, you know, the wail or the cry of loss is like one that just, I think, for any person who's empathically attuned is just like, oh, or an animal, you hear an animal in pain, like goodness. I mean, I'm not here to diagnose sociopathy, but if, if that doesn't evoke a, a, at least some sort of response of like, oh gosh, like what I wouldn't do to remove that pain, that their pain is your pain, empathy. Um, that seems like a very reflexive circuit, or at least I would hope so. Um, but when somebody experiences something positive, I think it's normal and healthy to have a, um, a graded set of responses. If it's somebody that we really love, um, we may not even know them. We think, yeah, like you're, you're just reflexively happy for them. Um, somebody that we dislike, I think there's a more natural tendency to be like, oh, you know, right? You know, as, as opposed to if that person were in pain, I would like to think that even if you, you, one didn't like them, that you would think like, oh, that, that sucks. I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, so I feel like there's some asymmetry in these empathic interactions. They're both empathy. One has negative valence, pain. The other one has positive valence, another member of our species or other species receiving reward. And we can delight in that. I mean, I, I'm almost embarrassed to admit how many ferret and otter and raccoon accounts I follow because I love seeing them eat. I love seeing the little hands of the raccoons. There's some great raccoon accounts, by the way. Um, and I delight in it. I like delight in it. I want to see the raccoons win. I don't know why. I just, I love animals. And so I suppose that's why. Um, so do you think that there, that we are asymmetrically wired for this empathic attunement? Um, can we observe that in other animals? I realize this might not be squarely in the wheelhouse of what your lab is focusing on, but I think it, it relates enough to the topics that we're covering today that I'm just, you know, if you'd like to speculate um, uh, on what might be going on there. Yeah, I, I can definitely speculate. It's something that we think about a lot, but again, you know, I, there's some there's some level of this, which is semantics. Um, I think of empathy as being defined as being able to understand another animal's emotion and also taking it on. So I think um, something that's a little bit different than emotional contagion, right? I see a panic. I'm in a group of panic. It's not the same thing as uh, as as empathy. Um, empathy is often used in in sort of certain contexts, like feeling sorry for someone, and it's maybe different if for feeling happy for someone. And this is something I was just talking about with one of my graduate students the other day. Why is there is, is there an asymmetry in in empathy for positive and negative, or is it just what we've studied? It's easier to study this. Mm. So there's a number of, of, you know, we don't know the answer, but I guess another conceptual framework to put out there, I'm not saying it's correct. It's, I think, just a, a good tool for debate, but um, it's not so much that there's good people and bad people and that good people are empathic and bad people aren't. Uh, so you know, it's not quite so simple. I, I guess the way I think about it is whether you view this other social agent as having aligned goals or agendas as you or are they adversarial? So if they're if they're in in your alliance, whatever that means, broadly defined versus adversarial, you would have a different feeling. And you know, it's it's you see this. I guess I was just I was just watching this. Okay, this is just sort of oversharing, but this is a podcast, not a primary research journal, so I can just say things, right? So I, I watch some trash TV sometimes, and you know these reality competition shows where it's like then you vote the two best friends into elimination, and they have to they have to w eliminate each other. Mildly or sadistic, <laughs> but you know then they're best friends, and they like like they you know, and then it's basically mutually exclusive. Either you can care about your friend and feel bad not wanting to send them home, or you you kick it you just you know you it's game time and you 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 compete and so you can see different individuals wrestling with these two brain states and and how to like what to do but they are essentially you know my 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 speculation is that viewing someone as a competitor and they're an adversary they are standing in the way of me getting what i want you, empathy goes down. It's like inversely correlated to empathy if you are viewed as a competitor. So things that would contribute to you creating a model where in, in a social agent, it is an adversary as opposed to an, a potential ally is really what it's going to come down to, to the degree that you feel empathy. 
You know, like you, the second someone, you realize someone's out to get you, no empathy, no, and no more empathy for this person who I just realized is out to get me or something like that. Or, you know, uh, in the case of being isolated for a long period of time, you've learned to exist on your own now. Maybe everyone's your competitor or adversary, you know, and none of you guys are really helping me do my day to, like, I don't really need you guys for anything. So, so I'm eating this food or whatever, you know, I, I think it just becomes different. Um, when you're part of an ecosystem and you realize that, you know, there's consequences and there's there's ev every action that you take, you know, every act of altruism will be recognized. And, there you know, there's 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 a there's some score being kept in your when you're part of a society. And um, and then when you're when you're not, there's no there's there's none of that. And so I think the degree to which you're integrated in society um it's almost like the extracellular matrix, you know, this is a really, this is an out there analogy, but you know, when you think about synapses being made, um, connections between people, there's also all the support material that facilitates certain patterns and certain connections from happening or not happening. And, and I think, um, that's, it's, it's stuff that we haven't quantified yet, but it doesn't, you know, I think those things should be studied. Years ago, I worked with at-risk kids. And, and a fair number of them had just arrived um, from a region of the world that had undergone dramatic sociopolitical um, evolution um, and change. And it was remarkable because we would put out a tray of food to eat, and then the, the format was everyone would serve themselves, and then um, you could uh, go get more food if, if, you, if everyone finished. Um, and a couple of these kids that had come from these very deprived environments um, would just take a, more than their their share. It was clear that by taking that, other kids weren't going to get any. And um, and I remember telling them, "Listen, we all have to eat more or less equal parts, and then we can. There is more. We can get more." And um, I'll never forget this kid's response. He just turned to me and he said, "You can't hit us." And I said, "That's true." I can't hit you. And, he's, and he said, so I'm just going to take as much as I want. And this took several weeks actually to, to work out, right? Because yeah. um, yeah. of course I would never hit him. And um, but Everyone's his adversary. Everyone's his adversary. And it was remarkable to see the evolution of these mm -hmm. kids across that. It was about three and a half weeks, yeah. um, at which point they actually became incredibly um, good at sharing. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it took a lot of work. It was almost as if even though they knew more – trays of food could arrive. Yeah. Um, not limitless, but there was there was an abundance of food. Yeah. In the moment they were they were solving for that short horizon moment. Yeah. And it and here we're talking about human beings mm -hmm. capable of speech and expression mm -hmm. of emotion, et cetera. And he understood the fundamental rule, which was I couldn't hit him. Therefore he could basically do what he wanted without that consequence. Mm -hmm. Which and, is the main consequence he'd face. Right. Apparently. It, exactly. And um and I remember, you know, it was it was so striking. I'll never forget that. And the evolution to a different, more um, altruistic state was wonderful, especially because of what I think what it did for him. Mm -hmm. But but I'll never forget thinking this is a human being who is essentially functioning like an animal, mm -hmm. like an animal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had a bulldog mastiff, and he was kind to other dogs. But if there were unattended to toys at the dog park, he was going to pick them up. <laughs> and he put them right in front of himself. And his, this was down in San Diego. And he'd sit with them right in front of him. And I'm like, Costello, you're not going to play with all those toys. But if another dog came and and he wouldn't, he would just sit in front of them. But another dog would come and try and take one of those toys. Mm -hmm. And he would he had these giant mitts. And he would just, <laughs> boom, stamp it out and drag it back. And so it seems that there are these very primitive circuits about a resource mm -hmm. allocation and protection of resources that – in the absence of understanding that there's a much bigger landscape, like Costello eventually figured out, like tug's a fun game, mm -hmm. although most dogs couldn't play tug with him. There were a few that could. He was a 90-pound bulldog. He was just a neck like this. <laughs> but, you know, to see this in a human being was just so striking. I just, as you're describing this, it's like this adversary versus um, neutral versus uh, friend. It, it's just so striking and it's got to be you know, that, that the brain, as complex as it is, I've often wondered, and our colleague Marcus Meister once said that, you know, circuits in the brain um, can broadly be divided into these sorts of circuits, into yum, yuck, and meh. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> right? Which is far too simplistic, right? But who am I to argue with the great Marcus Meister? Um, and I'm not going to, but it's sort of interesting. We sort of bin our responses into, yes, okay, let, let's cooperate. Or yes, let's you're, cooperate. You're summarizing yeah. valence. Yeah. <laughs> or, or no way, no chance. Uh -huh. Like mine. Yeah. Versus like, meh, meh. And, um, you know, as complex as I'd like to think the brain is and we are, I mean, maybe when it comes down to behaviors and how we interpret input and our decision making, um, maybe it's really all about feelings of safety and feelings of um, relatedness. Yeah. I think it's also about the experiential statistics that you have been exposed to. So this this boy who says, you, I'm going to take all this food because you can't hit me. I mean, we don't know, but the the picture that grows out of my imagination is this boy's had a lot of experiences of people hitting them, mm -hmm. a lot of experiences of not enough food, mm -hmm. and not a lot of experiences of strangers being nice to them, you know, like not a lot of people that you could trust. That's the that's the experiential statistics that would fit this model. Someone like like you who's coming in being like, oh no, there's more for I'm going to give you guys more food for free. You know, I'm going to give you even more food for it's you know. The experiential statistics are you've come from a world of abundance where people are generous, you know, generosity being you've learned being generous can make you have a lifelong friend and all these amazing opportunities that make your quality of life that food is you're never gonna think about food again. It's about the relationships because that's your experiential statistics. And so I think this is such a profound concept about about neuroscience and the brain about our social structures and how they form what makes a structure egalitarian or despotic right like how how can we as individuals take a structure that is is one format let's say despotic hierarchy and evolve it into something that's more egalitarian and um what are what are the 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 levers and what are the parameter spaces that we can pull on and i think these are questions that i mean it's hard to think of what could be more important um but that perspective of ex thinking about from experiential statistics, I think really supports, you know, the need of, of, of diversity, having, bringing in people to academia who've had very different experiences, experiential statistics, different biases of what they're going to think is interesting to work on and study. And obviously in every, every sector of our society. So I think, um, how can we get more diverse sets of experiences represented at each decision-making body that really matters. Yeah, amen to that. And also to be able to understand that um, differences in background experience um, require that we, we, earlier you mentioned theory of mind, this ability to get into the mindset of others and, and sort of assume or presume certain mindsets in order to hopefully create a more benevolent environment for everybody. Um, you know, it, it requires, um, you know, realizing that some people's social interactions are, you know, have been terrible or traumatic or, um, you know, it requires a, a departure from self, essentially. It requires a, a, this empathy or something like empathy. Um, in all directions, right? I mean, in all directions, it requires that everyone at least make some effort to try and understand that. I do wonder, and maybe someone would put on the comments on YouTube, maybe maybe you're aware, um, Kay, of um, whether or not kids are being trained in that beautiful period of time of life where neuroplasticity is so robust, mm -hmm. um, although it does continue throughout the right lifespan, it is especially robust early in life, to, um, to be uh, in a healthy way, empathically attuned to be able mm -hmm. to have theory of mind, mm -hmm. more robust theory of mind. Yeah, so uh, I think it's it's really, I mean, I'm, I'm so I'm a parent. I have two kids that are in public school and I think their public school is rated, you know, it's fine, but uh, <laughs> we won't say it's, where you it's, live. it's all right. <laughs> and, um, but, but at the school, they definitely do get education about um, more holistic health and emotional regulation, I think, and, and considering others. Um, that's been, that's, that's a big focus of the school. And I think that's actually really important. I, I, I mean, you know, again, I'm, I'm super biased from, from my upbringing, but 
my kids are going to learn math whenever it's time to learn the math. They'll learn it whenever they need it. You know, whenever they need it, they're going to learn it in a couple, I don't know, a couple weeks and figure it out, do the thing. Um, most of the things that they learn, they're going to forget them and then have to relearn them. Um, so what are the things that you're going to really need to know no matter what you choose to do? And I think regulating your your own emotions in, and and engaging other individuals in a healthy, sustainable way that, you know, and I mean sustainable in terms of the longevity of the relationships. And I think those are the things that end up really mattering. So I think um, also this question about exposure to abundance and scarcity uh, is really interesting too. I mean, I don't know if that's a direction we want to go into. So please. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, you know, this whole, you know, it sort of sounds sort of new agey when I say, you know, abund the abundance mindset, right? Um, I mean, you see this in people who are like uh, recently divorced or newly single for whatever reason, like is, is the world a place where like Finding um, partnership is is relatively straightforward with some work involved, um, or is it like, well, there's only one person on the planet for you, and they might be dead already, right? Like, um, is there if someone else's business takes off, maybe someone you, you went to college or high school with, or their lab is doing really well, you're seeing them, you know, tremendously successful. That maybe they made a hundred million dollars in a in a new in a company acquisition. Do you immediately feel like, oh, those are resources that I don't have? Um, even though I'm not in that business, um, or do you see it as, wow, that there must be a lot of money out there that um, that people could earn and, and potentially make? I really, you know, prescribe and believe in this abundance versus scarcity mindset framework. Um, I think there's absolutes, like the example we just talked about, this the, the kid, the, you know, there's just not food. There's scarcity of food, fact, you know. Of course, there are individuals that experience scarcity of various different needs, but many of us, we reach a threshold of abundance and then it becomes relative. We have everything we absolutely physiologically need if we're not comparing ourselves to anyone else. But then once we were, enter the social arena, comparison is essential. Why do we compare ourselves to others? It's, it's ingrained because social status is something that we need to attend to. A large part of our, our, our brain is devoted to representing our relative social rank What's our place with a social network? What's the dynamic? How do we fit into the social landscape? And comparison, I think, is just a way to do that. That's That's been evolutionarily conserved, perhaps for less of a good purpose at this point, because so many of our basic survival needs are met for the large majority of, of humans on the planet today. Not for everybody, of course, but so, yet what is the percentage of humans who feel they have everything that they desire? How many people feel like they don't want for anything. And, you know, it's interesting because having things doesn't make you have an abundance mindset. Having abundance does not, is not sufficient to give you the mindset of abundance. That's such an important statement. I mean, just, it, I don't think they could be restated enough. Um, you've studied social rank. Mm -hmm. uh, people hear social rank and hierarchy and I have to guess that at least some neurons in their amygdala and other areas of the brain get buzzing because as soon as people hear social rank, they, I think, naturally start to think, well, well where am I in this social rank? And um, how do I feel about how that rank is, you know, established and, and all sorts of interesting and important questions. Um, some people get very angry that there are billionaires on this planet, mm -hmm. especially given that. In most major cities, you don't have to go very far to see people who have very limited uh, resources. Mm -hmm. So social rank is something that um, I think exists in every little niche, like, you know, at work, and, and maybe even in the family, there's social rank. Mm -hmm. um, I have a sibling. I remember um, who got more of a, of a piece of cake, like even a slight difference in that, well, you know, was something that my older sibling would point out. Um, cause she was more effective at getting the slightly larger piece of cake. Cause I was, <laughs> until I was, you know, big enough to fend for myself. Um, and my friends with larger sibling pools in their family, it was especially competitive. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever gone to a meal with somebody who had a lot of siblings. They eat fast. They, they, different resource <laughs> allocation <laughs> methods than if they were an only child versus yep. uh, one sibling. Mm -hmm. There, there's variation here. I'm generalizing, but, um, but yeah, let's talk about social rank. What do we know about 
how social rank is organized in the brain, how we perceive our own social ranking, and um, yeah, what's the what's the modern science on this stuff? I find it fascinating. Um, I'm not scared of any topic, well, most any topic, and I think this is one that that affects us all. Yeah, I mean. I'll first say that social rank is something very specific to a certain type of hierarchy that assumes a linear hierarchy, which sometimes forms, but oftentimes there's different types of hierarchies that are flatter or more amorphous. It's not really clear who's who's the alpha on the playground. I, I don't know. There's this click here. There's, you know, there's, and it can be dynamic. Right, right. It's yeah. dynamic. It's not always organized as such. But um, if you get animals into a sort of small space, um, you will see in many species, especially within the males, um, forming a linear hierarchy. And um, we wanted to explore this. And so I think one of the biggest challenges with studying social rank, and this is something we've struggled with as well, is how do you control for the individual identity versus the, uh, the actual rank? So what I mean by this is, let's say there's a study that says, um, that, you know, neurons in a certain brain region fire to animals of different ranks according to the rank, fire most of the alpha, less, 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 less down to the rank, you know. Does that, does that tell us that this brain region encodes social rank? Maybe in a loose sense. And I'm sure that when rank issues come up, a lot of the brain lights up for different, different reasons. But for example, let's say the amygdala would respond more to the alpha, maybe because it encodes social rank, but maybe also because whoever is the dominant is the one who's most likely to have consequences. And so all of my interactions with the alpha are relatively high consequence. And so I'm sort of stressed out whenever I'm talking to the alpha, paying attention. And, you know, you remember all the interactions you have with your boss more so than, you know, someone else. There's an attention hierarchy. Subordinates attend more to dominance. And so there's, it's almost hard to make this comparison because it's not all flat. Like the the clean experiment, which we are still trying to do, it's it's difficult to do the perfect experiment, would be if you take an individual and change their rank. So for example, um, I like to use this example with Barack Obama, so just indulge me, I know that this is from a while ago, but once upon a time I met Barack Obama for a very brief moment when he was president, and, and maybe there's some neurons that light up, oh wow, you know, there's the Barack Obama slash president neurons, but if they are identity neurons, once he was no longer president, if I was to be presented with Barack Obama, then they would still fire. If they were rank neurons, then maybe after he was no longer president, it just these neurons fire to whoever is president now. And so I think that experiment is very difficult to do and has not been done, but we're working on it right now um, in uh, uh, another experiment where we take animals and they're living in groups uh, and we rank them all. And then we rehouse them. So everybody has a rank that they start with. Then we put all the alphas together, put all the betas together, et cetera, so that everybody forms a new rank. Then you have animals that went up a rank, went down a rank, or stayed the same for every group. And so that's something that we're looking at right now. So initially, you take a pool of animals, and then let's say you got your number one, two, three, four, just for sake of mm -hmm. simplicity. Mm -hmm. Let's say I take the number four, mm -hmm. lowest in that yep. hierarchy, but now I make them the top of a new hierarchy. That's right. That's right. Got it. And so it's really preliminary, and we'll see what happens, but- we're investigating, it, it seems that when you take alphas, intermediates, or subordinates and put them together into new hierarchies, it takes them different amounts of time and the dynamics are very different in forming the new hierarchy. Hmm. And so- In any kind of predictable way that you're willing to share or is uh, it just too early? I think it's too early, but I'll just say, I guess it seems like the, um, the intermediates might be taking the longest amount of time mm. to form the hierarchy. They don't know where they sit in the hierarchy. They are, they were flexible or something. Mm -hmm. Whereas the dominants, they're going to duke it out, and then you know we're going to we're going to battle. There'll be defeat. It's quick. The fight doesn't last that long. Subordinates, you know, I, I, I you know we have to still observe. This is all still, you know, being. We'll see if everything replicates, but certainly the dynamics are different. What the exact readouts? We you know we're working on what the features are, what key features to to see, but. It's kind of uncanny because these are genetically inbred animals that are all housed in the, these should be all, everyone should be the same theoretically, but this makes me think that during certain developmental periods, rank is shaping your long lasting development. 
I think it's a simple, similar phenomenon perhaps to the older child, younger child phenomenon where, you know, if you're the oldest, you go into the world and you have lots of different roles. You might be the bottom, you know, you're going to play on sports teams and be in different classes and have all these jobs. But the, the, the leadership desire slash potential skill seems to be correlated in a very non-scientific way. Right? Uh, you know, the, the number of presidents that's often old, oldest or only children, this type of thing. It's a, it's a loose correlation. There's a lot of other reasons why it might not be behavioral, but there's sort of, you know, fluffy, fluffy correlations about that. I think there's something to it, though. Um, when plasticity is happening, you're, this, this becomes your most familiar state of assuming a certain role, and that attractor state deepens with more time spent there. I find that so fascinating. I've also observed, and I think I've seen a few papers on, I don't know how rigorous these papers are, that um, youngest, or let's just say not oldest siblings, um, here we're setting aside single uh, children that don't have any siblings, but that youngest siblings uh, do tend to quote unquote break the mold more in terms of uh, uh, socio and cultural norms of the family. They, they venture further mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in terms of... Um, experiences and value yeah. systems, they're often seen as um, having had fewer constraints than the older sibling, which may mm -hmm. or may not be true, uh -huh. um, but that the youngest uh, siblings often will um, take on risk yeah. that older siblings won't. Yeah. 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 And that's certainly been my observation. More nonconformists. Right. I mean, I'm a young, younger brother of an older sister, um, but, and th but then there was times in our childhood where she was out of the house and I was at home just with mm -hmm. my mom. So, mm -hmm. so that sort of changes things, but, and this is very dynamic. I realize very we're playing dynamic. here in, in a kind of a loose space, but, yeah, yeah. but I find social rank stuff to be super interesting. I grew up in a big pack of mostly boys. Um, that's just kind of how it worked out in my neighborhood, um, at the time. Um, and it was very interesting because it was very clear. It was a dynamic hierarchy where if we were skateboarding, certain kids were alpha. If we were playing soccer, other yeah. kids were alpha. If we were doing anything artistic, um, if it was uh, kind of geeky knowledge and and nerdy stuff, um, you know, then you know might have been somebody else uh, who yeah. had the knowledge um, mm -hmm. and had the information that people wanted. So I think mm -hmm. dynamic hierarchies are really interesting, mm -hmm. and I think um, get us out of that sort of more standard alpha, like kind of chest beating, telling yeah. everyone what to do, dictatorial model. I mean, and this is now fully out of any science land and into speculation, opinion land. But I think that type of structural structure where when you're doing different tasks different individuals become the alpha or the leader because it's based on competence is very healthy i think structures where you have a locked down this is the this is the hierarchy where someone's the boss of you because of this one skill but then there's all these other skills that they're not as they're they're not superior to, you know they they, sh they don't not, don't outrank you at and and so how do you work all of that out and so I think that's also something about keeping score. Like, what is what is the rank, right? And so we did this experiment where we designed a task. Um, animals are trained that a cue predicts reward delivery. Only one animal can get it at a time. It's just a very narrow place. So if one animal is getting it, you can't get it. Then um, we would have an four animals that, that are cage mates, four mice that are cage mates, and we would have two of them duke it out at each point. And they, we know the ranks, the ranks are stable. They have a rank one, two, three, four in the cage and everybody does a round robin. Ones versus twos, ones versus threes, twos they versus fight. Three. Yeah, they Yeah, well, they, they do a round robin in this reward competition task. They're food deprived, you know, and we pr we present rewards. What's the, what happens? And so subordinates do win some of the times, even though dominants win more, All the, you know, they, they consistently win more. And we found that prefrontal cortical neurons, you could, represent very stably and decode which animal was dominant um, flat uh, regardless of the trial. And then when you looked at whether we could decode competitive success, meaning who was going to win that next trial. So there's a new trial every 30 or 40 seconds. And so, but 30 seconds before, which is as far as we can measure, because then we're like kind of into the, the previous trial. As soon as the last trial ends, even before the next trial ends, you can predict above chance s s significantly which animal is going to win the next trial. Just based on the firing pattern of prefrontal cortical That's neurons. That's right. So yeah. you can predict winners and losers. You can predict 
and understand where they are in the hierarchy as well, based on the acti- activation of neurons prior to the battle. That's right. It's like right. recording from the, um, by analogy, it's like recording from the prefrontal cortex of two, let's say business competitors mm-hmm. or um, martial arts competitors. Mm-hmm. And you can predict who's going to win based on the pattern of firing in their brains prior to the competition. That's right. And so um, that suggests all sorts of things. Number one, it doesn't mean these competitions are not independent. There's something about the state of the animal. And when we looked at, is it just whoever won the previous trial? That did not account for Mm. this. And so um, I thought this was really interesting. But when you look at the decoding accuracy for dominance versus subordinates about uh, who will win the next trial. For dominance, it stays pretty flat. It just has to do with, I think, this is my speculation of our data, um, that you know they, they either are engaged or they're not engaged. The subordinates, the decoding accuracy, is, is, above a, is above chance, but then it shoots up somewhere around closer to the Q presentation. And so my speculation about that is that the subordinates are looking at the dominance. They're looking, the dominant doesn't look like they're, it doesn't look like they're going to go for it. Okay. Yeah, oh, they're, they're, it looks like they're turning away. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. So it's it's not like they're both going out full every time. It's it's a calculation. Which trials, oh, he's not paying attention. You know, it's like when you're driving in traffic and you're trying to find a, the, the moment to cut over and you're waiting for the person who's like te- texting and they're just, there's a big space and then everybody's just getting in right here. You know, you can just see, you're like looking for clues about the state of love, you know, of competition. And then, and then the dominance they are not looking at the subordinate. They're just doing whatever they feel like doing. It's like uh, there's a, I think there's that one scene in Mad Men where something happened in the work environment and um, and it was clear someone's account didn't sell or something didn't work out for one person versus the other. And I think one of the characters says to uh, Don Draper, who's clearly one of the alphas in that work environment mm-hmm. by virtue of yep. role and, and um, position, um, says, you know, you know, I sometimes think about the way that you blank, 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 and blank. And he goes on this brief tirade about how upset he was. And um, and Draper says, well, oh, I don't think about you at all. Mm-hmm. And then the elevator, I believe, closes. And it really cemented his status in the office as somebody who's really not paying much attention to what other people are doing. He's just making decisions according to what's going to be best for the firm, and in some cases for himself, and in some cases both. So I think that's essentially what you're talking about. Yeah, I think it's um, it's kind of the nature of the structure. That's what makes you the alpha. Is your you you have you have other things that are occupying your attention, and your your visionary status. Hopefully, if you're you know a, a productive, successful alpha, and for a sustainable you know group, and then everyone else is they don't need, they don't need to have the big picture they don't they don't you know it it becomes the reinforcement schedule is different I'm just looking for validation am I am I playing my role okay it's a very different mindset I think you know as a scientist when you're a trainee sometimes you're a, a supporting member on a team where you're getting instructions someone's telling you what to do versus the moment where you get your own project and maybe you're working by yourself maybe there's no one to command but no one's telling you what to do. That is, to me, one of the biggest thresholds to step over when you're becoming a scientist or an investigator is the first time where you just do something and, like, try an experiment no one told you to do. And it feels super weird. It feels like you're sneaking around or something. And and then, you know, I think, I think um, in today's mentorship chain, sometimes that that happens too late. I think if we could have that experience happen earlier, um, I think that would only be good for for the future of research. I agree. I was very fortunate that my graduate advisor um, told me, look, I'm going to help you, but I'm going to have two kids while you're in the lab and I'm not going to be around a lot. So you're going to have to figure it out. Don't burn the lab down. Don't kill yourself with any of the poisons in the lab. And then my postdoc advisor um, the late and great Ben Barris um, largely treated the postdocs as as junior professors from an early mm-hmm. stage, and I remember mm-hmm. thinking mm-hmm. he can't control the experiments I'm going to do. This is up to me, and he and and a great number of us who were training with him at that time went on to have our own lab. So I think um, uh, th- there's really something important to that model. And of course, we're discussing the research field, but um, this could be exported to any number of different fields because what those mentors were essentially training us to do was to um, to assume the role that we would eventually have as opposed to be subordinates. Um, 
Do you watch Chimp Empire? <sighs> so actually, um, just this week, yeah, yesterday and the day before, before this, uh, a postdoc interview who worked with the chimps on Chimp Empire <gasps> visited and interviewed him in my lab and um, talked about his work. So I have not seen Chimp Empire, but it's at the very top of my to-do list. Oh, God, it's so good. <laughs> I don't want to spend the next 20 minutes talking about it, but you see all sorts of interesting um, behavior, very relevant to human behavior. Hierarchies, yes, but also um, altruistic behavior, um, allopathic grooming. I mean, in, in chimp culture, um, as I've learned from the show, assuming it's accurate, um, that who grooms who is very important. Um, and there's all sorts of interesting um, maneuvers that subordinates make. And there's all sorts of interesting displays of vigor that the alpha makes to remind people that they are the alpha. And then as they age or make mistakes of judgment, the subordinates also will feign deference. They'll be like, oh yeah, you're the alpha. You're really tough. And secretly they're plotting to replace the alpha. Um, so whether or not we're talking about a scene from Mad Men or we're talking about Chimp Empire, or we're talking about research laboratories or, um, or any other landscape, kindergarten, mm -hmm. I think these circuits are active in all of us. And the sooner that we uh, acknowledge those and try and find um, ones that generalize to the, the goodness of as many uh, members as possible, um, we're not doing our task. But clearly you're doing the task. So, okay, social rank is something that uh, we need to acknowledge, no doubt. Um, which actually leads me to what might seem like a disparate topic, but um, one that I know we're both very interested in and that you're focusing on now, which is psychedelics. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. one of the interesting things about psychedelics is their capacity to increase neuroplasticity, um, but also some of the psychedelics, and I realize MDMA is not a classic psychedelic, but they are classified as empathogens. They increase empathy for self and others. So. Uh, what are you looking into with psychedelics? Which psychedelics? And um, yeah, what brought you to the study of psychedelics? And by the way, I've done participated in clinical, because people will wonder, I have participated in clinical trials for uh, psilocybin and MDMA. I don't recommend people do psychedelics recreationally. I do think they hold great promise for the treatment of depression and trauma, but people need to be careful. There are certain people who could not and should not take psychedelics because it would be genuinely unsafe for them um, psychologically, especially young people. So there's my disclaimer. And mm -hmm. um, But they are fascinating compounds. So um, I guess I've always been interested in psychedelics. I think I wrote my undergraduate thesis about, it's just about hallucinations produced by psychedelics, psychotic breaks, and REM sleep and schizophrenia, just comparing what is the common thread when our brain creates a reality that is not objectively there. And um, psychedelics, of course, is a way that we can experience that and remember it and recall it in a way that's very difficult with REM sleep and, and sometimes with psychotic breaks. Um, obviously, schizophrenia is not something that you can transiently give yourself and have that experience. So I think having the ability to move into other brain states is what makes it so attractive. I think the other component is the the plasticity. You can you can have an experience, and perhaps the firsthand experience is you have an epiphany that you take with you. It's life changing, and you know your life habits are completely different for a long lasting way after this singular experience. is is kind of one of the things that makes it so different from all of the other. Um, therapeutic treatments that we've got, or most of the other ones, I'd say. Um, and so for me, you know, right now there's a lot of work going on exploring psychedelics as a therapy for various different conditions, disease states. Um, I think that's great. I think it's really important work. I'm glad a lot is being done on that. I think my focus is is to turn over some rocks that might not have been turned over yet and just to get really down at a quantitative, rigorous mathematical level of what is a hallucination. For example, um, when I ask this question, what is a hallucination? I'm interested in the actual cellular mechanisms. Are we just, you know, we think about neurons having signal to noise and neuromodulation as changing that. Are we just changing the signal to noise ratio and then pattern completing all the noise and that's what a hallucination is? 
we just, you know, take that's we're just reinterpreting noise and, and putting sort of existing maps. Everything's fitting to an existing mold or map that we've already got that then appears as some hallucination. Um, or is and, 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 you know, maybe it doesn't have to be hallucination. There's also uh, obviously some various different thresholds of the psychedelic experience. Um, but all these clinical statements, these human self-reported um, qualitative descriptions of the psychedelic experience, things like be, having just more positive outlook, being uh, uniting one and self and other, like a sort of, you know, clarity of the world, um, more labile in thoughts, more flexible thoughts. Uh, we are trying to just create actual ways to test them. So for example, this idea about what is, what is going on in your mind when, you, when you're when you having a psychedelic experience, all of these different states might feel more labile. Um, it, it maybe the transition probabilities between different brain states of like happy, sad, thinking, nostalgic, you know, maybe it's just all looser. And so you can access everything because the transition probabilities are just high. Another possibility is that, you, and maybe it's dose dependent, at a certain dose you go into another brain state. And so previously, we've done this in the same project that I was just telling you about rank. Um, we were recording for prefrontal cortical neurons and looking at all the behaviors. And so the behaviors for representing social rank, we, we don't know what they are. So we used computer vision to extract a bunch of behavioral motifs and then tried to understand what's the best model that would predict, you know, what the animal's going to do next not just wins and losses, but all the subtle gestures. Are we going to fight? Are we going to give it up? Are we going to back off and predict the behaviors from prefrontal cortical activity? And the best model that we found was something called a hidden Markovian model, which essentially just means that there are hidden states. You might think of them as moods. Um, you might give them some other name, but I'll, I'll, I'll use moods loosely. It's not perfect, but um, that's kind of one way that helps me think about hidden states where you have certain statistics of behaviors that you would produce. If I'm sad, there's certain things I'm going to do. It's a different statistics than uh, when I'm happy, different probability of going surfing if I'm sad or happy or, you know, things like that. So we basically found that there are a certain number of hidden states. And so if you are on psychedelics, would that change the number of states or just the transitions between them? We also found in our prefrontal cortical representation that there's a certain distance of the representation of self and other in this, you know, dimensionality reduced activity space. So for mumbo jumbo, that just means there's a representation of self and other. There's some quantifiable distance in in abstract, you know, terms in the brain. And we can quantify if those representations get closer together and merge. Of self versus other. Of self versus other. So that's something that we would want, to, we, we would be looking for huh. if you are putting psychedelics on. These are the, these are questions that I'm interested in that are under construction. So right now we're recording from um, animals while we're giving them psilocybin uh, using neural pixels recordings. So we're recording from thousands of neurons um, in prefrontal cortex and other parts of cortex because the, you know, the shank goes to lots of places and looking at how um, animals respond in a conflict task. So there's, there's trials where there's a cue that predicts reward, a cue that predicts shock, then there's some trials where both cues are presented and both outcomes are presented. And the reason for this conflict trial is that actually if you give, you know, moderate to low doses of psilocybin or most drugs, honestly, animals can do this. You know, even on lots of different drugs, most people can still eat food and avoid getting hit by this truck. I mean, there are exceptions, of course. But generally speaking, you know, there's a lot of different brain states where you can still do these, these essential functions pretty robustly. But it's about what happens in the more ambiguous zone. What happens when there's a conflict? And, and what do you do? How do you, when, there, when it's a little gray, I think that's when you can see a shift in valence assignment. So that's something that we've been looking for and, and trying to see if, um, you know, in clinical studies, they're exploring set and setting um, as maybe the factors that have in the past historically given very unpredictable outcomes for psychedelic therapies. 
Um, it's possible that it's set in setting. It's also possible that there's individual variability. It's possible that there are biomarkers that can predict which individuals would be well suited for this type of therapy. And so those are also things that we're interested in. I find this so fascinating. And I, I just want to applaud you again for taking on these hard questions. These are fairly high level questions. Um, certainly there's a lot of uh, clinical trials exploring psychedelics like psilocybin and their role in treating mental health. Um, and there's at the same time, um, a real dearth of studies exploring mechanistically how these compounds are working. I mean, um, I do want to tip my hat to all the folks that have explored dendritic changes and you know, so cellular changes in the level of neurons and, and on and on. But in terms of these like higher level states of um, self versus other recognition um, in psychedelics, um, you know, that, those are tough questions that need to be addressed mechanistically, and it's clear you're doing that. Um, I, I think this, um, this notion that you're testing of whether or not psychedelics reveal more accessibility or lability, as you described it, of between different states, like, oh, wow, I can actually move from sad to happy. There's a, there's a route for that, mm -hmm. and you can experience that as mm -hmm. opposed to just being told that. Right. Hey, when you're feeling sad, feel your, you know, the field of psychology, especially pop psychology, is in a real crisis right now, in my opinion, because we're told to feel our feelings, but then we're also told to not react to our feelings, which sounds great. But if those feelings get intense enough, that's very hard for most people to do. So it's feel your feelings, but don't stay with it. You know what? The, there's the cathartic model, you know, like feel your feelings and, and get them out screaming and et cetera. And then there's the, the no, you know, you, the more you engage a neural pathway, the stronger that neural pathway gets. And therefore you're just going to feel more anger. There's a lot of conflict right now in terms of the popular psychology version of this, uh, whereas the, the clinical fields, I think, have a, a, an understanding that hasn't been translated. I think one other thing about psychedelics that is interesting is that the transitions into states is also more labile. Like if you start feeling a little sad, you know, there's the potential to feel very, very sad and to go into a, a, a state of sadness of, of an intensity you've never experienced before, which, by the way, could be therapeutically beneficial. Um, I think there's some evidence for that, provided there's adequate support before, during, and after those sessions. Um, but I think most people feel when they're not on psychedelics, we'll feel emotions that are uncomfortable and we'll do all sorts of things to try and avoid those emotions. So I, I'm not speaking as a clinician here, but I just, again, I think what the, the, uh, the range and specificity of questions that you're asking about psychedelics, I, I find so exciting. Another, uh, uh, reason I'll say that you just, we want to have you back to, to discuss those findings when, the, when they come out. Let's talk a little bit about you. Okay. Um, <laughs> I've known you for a while, but to be honest, I think this is the longest conversation we've ever had, which is one of the reasons I love it doing is. this podcast. I get to sit down with colleagues and have intellectual slash other conversations of, of substantial depth that I wouldn't have the opportunity to have elsewhere. I know enough about you, however, to know that um, you've been involved in various things. Um, I'm not going to say peripheral to science, but you have other interests as well. Um, as I recall, um, you have been a yoga instructor or if, or you've been involved in the uh, kind of wellness fitness uh, community industry. Tell us about that. And then I'm also curious about um, how you structure your day, your routines, given that you're a parent of two young children, you run a very large laboratory operating at the very highest level. Um, and of course, you value important things like relationships and relationship to self and health and all these sorts of things. So um, not to make it too open-ended, but and to, like, tell us of tell us of your interests and and of your relationship to wellness and fitness and well being. Yeah, um, I guess I think you know I everybody comes to their their calling in in some what feels like a path that you couldn't predict. But when you look at it outside, I guess both of my parents are professors, so it doesn't look super surprising that I'm a professor. But that's not how it felt to me when I was in high school. I was a total rebel. I just threw parties. At my house, my parents weren't there. Sorry, everybody who's listening. It's not, I don't recommend that. But I just <laughs> cared about, I just cared about having fun and sports. And um, I think school wasn't maybe challenging enough for me at that time. I didn't necessarily recognize that, that was what it was. But um, <clears throat> I've always enjoyed being really active. And that's what makes me feel good. It's, I, I, I definitely um, agree with stuff you've said on your podcast about having exercise routines in the morning that really influence the rest of your day. 
I, I didn't always exercise in the morning. I have different phases, but um, yeah, after I was an undergrad, I took some time to travel around Australia, backpack around Australia, live in some very remote places, spend some time living in a tent. Then I was a yoga instructor. Um, then I, I went to grad school in the Bay Area. I had a very active uh, hobby of, I was a semi-professional break dancer. I was very into break dancing. Really? <laughs> Sorry, really? The area. Yes, we did. Um, you know, halftime shows, or I guess technically third quarter timeout shows at the Oracle Stadium for the Golden State Warriors. I was wow. the one girl who could do a windmill, so they would use me. Like, oh, okay, windmills. Someone's so, going to find footage of this. Yeah, yeah. There's some, you know, very mediocre footage of me break dancing, um, and I was just really into it. But I think that's where my work life balance passion comes from. I talk about it a lot. I think about it a lot. And people say to me all the time, well, you, is this really true? Why do you why do you preach all this work-life balance stuff when, you know, you must have been a workaholic at some point in your life? And I think, you know, when I was younger, I definitely didn't like the idea that you had to only be one thing. I wanted to be so many things. I couldn't decide. It was a huge challenge. I was going to be a writer. I was going to be a yoga instructor. I was going to be... I never really thought I was going to be a professional dancer. I just wasn't good enough. And there's not careers to be made from dancing, really. It's very difficult. But, um, you know, had a lot of other interests. And I wanted to prove, I don't know who I wanted to prove it to. I think myself at first. And then eventually it made me, made me feel like I should maybe prove it to everyone that you can have a very whole life and not sacrifice everything. You don't have to choose between family and career or personal life. You can have them all. You just have to decide that it's a priority and own that and make those choices on, on a daily basis and comes down to time management. And so it's been a very, even though it looks like, oh, Kay just likes to have fun and have all these other hobbies, it, it's, it's important because I think that we need more role models, in especially in academic science, where people bring their whole selves to their job. And even though your job is a very specific thing, um, because you have a role as a mentor, and, you know, I suppose the mentor-apprenticeship relationship has evolved, then there's, I've, you know, lots of comments about that too, um, in academia. I still think, ultimately, when, when I was working in someone else's lab, and I definitely looked up to them. They were the role model, obviously. I'm looking at, yes, they're science, but I'm looking at how they r make this all work. How are, you, how are you doing this? How, how do they live their lives and how do they approach balancing it all? And so I guess I just wanted to put some more data points on the, on the scoreboard where people are having lots of hobbies and other non-work activities while still making meaningful contributions. And it doesn't make you less of a, hum less of a scientist or less of a person because you're a whole human. If anything, perhaps it makes people better scientists. Yeah. D did definitely. your exploration of, of yoga and or break dancing inform anything about your, your research or was it really about resetting uh, your mind and body in healthy ways so that you could return to the lab feeling excited about returning to the lab? I think I've always been of the mindset where sometimes things don't, go well in a certain arena and it's it doesn't feel good to have all your eggs in that basket S stuff goes wrong sometimes the experiment doesn't work sometimes you find something out you lose the whole data set it's you know bad news happens in the lab and um i think just want to diversify your portfolio so that your happiness portfolio is not entirely based on your accomplishments at work um i think we just want to have more elements and the same thing goes for, you know, at one point when I was really into dancing, I got a very serious injury and it took this huge part of my life away from me. I was so glad I had work. Thank God I have work, you know, I have something I can do else. And I just think having a lot of different parts of your life make you more flexible, more creative, more awake, more engaged. And, you know, when I don't, I definitely have been a workaholic when I was a postdoc and assistant professor period, definitely did not make enough time for myself to have a, a richer, a rich personal life at certain points. And very quickly, I just wither away into a shell of a human, a shell, an empty shell of a, the person I used to be. And it's noticeable. Everybody can feel it. You can't pretend, you know, everyone that works with you feels it eventually. And so 
I think that's a big thing. And so as I've taken feedback from my anonymous lab surveys and other other forms of feedback and just reflecting, it's clear I, you know, taking your lifestyle into and having agency over designing your lifestyle to be ideal for you is super important. So a typical day for me uh, might look like, um, okay, the last work day, let's say I woke up actually, so it was early high tide. So I got to wake up in the dark, pack up my bags, go surfing, and then get home before surf, see my friends in the water. And I think surfing is a lot of things. It's exercise. It's a cold plunge. It's photons, some of your favorite things. Maybe a little bit meditative, maybe some social community. Then, and I, you know, go every time at the same day. So there's the same group of people. Then I go home, make the kids their snacks, breakfast, drop them off at school. Then I go to a lab and then run lab meeting um, and have meetings. Most of my day when I'm at work is spent meeting with people, drawing on a whiteboard, mostly meeting with my trainees um, is what I like to spend most of my time on. Of course, there's other stuff that gets in the mix, like administrative, whatever. And then come home at a pretty early hour, pick up my kids, make dinner, and then go to sleep kind of early. Kind of boring these days. That's my typical day. <laughs> Sounds exciting to me. Sounds exciting to me. Um, I think uh, if one were to stay up late, then one feels sleep deprived if they wake up early. If you wake up late, you're missing out on the early morning sunrise, the surf, all of that. I've never surfed. Actually, once I paddled out once when I was in college and uh, there was no surf, so I would paddle back in. But um, I keep hearing about this surfing thing and um, people seem to love it. That's one of my concerns is that if you fall in love with it, you're going to spend a lot of time out in the ocean. But <laughs> clearly it's all serving you well and um, uh, must be wonderful to be a child in your home. I can imagine how much fun it is and how interesting it is. Um, you mentioned several times uh, mentorship and trainees. And uh, it's clear that uh, reshaping um, the landscape of science for the next generation coming up is something that's a real passion to you. Um, I take great uh, pleasure in asking this because, um, you know, it wasn't long ago that you and I were graduate students and postdocs and more or less the same vintage, right? And as is the case, people retire, people die. This is the reality of life. And people move up, up the ranks uh, as you have. Um, so what are some of the things that you're most passionate about in terms of shaping the future of science, um, in particular research science, but maybe more broadly. And um, what are you doing about it? I think that um, science, academic culture has evolved. And, and I guess I should start by just saying, first, I, as I was driving over here, it was just a beautiful drive. And I'm just thinking, it is so cool that we get to do this for a living. Isn't it amazing that studying whatever I find interesting to me is something that I can, you know, have a secure job for? And then just thinking about cool ideas and directions and talking about it, stuff that I would do for free is is really my job. And I, I just am so grateful to have that. And um, I think there are a lot of beautiful sides of academia that sometimes don't get the airtime that they deserve. And of course, there's a lot of doom and gloom. There always has been when I was a grad student. There's lots of doom and gloom in the ether. There's plenty now. Um, I think perhaps it has become a little bit more dire, um, the plight of academia right now. Uh, there's been a nationwide drop of postdocs in general. There's a, just a mass exodus away from academia to industry. And I think that reflects the changing environment. And so um, I guess when I was a graduate student, I had this book in my desk drawer called Advice for Young Investigator written by Ramoni Cajal, which is a great book. It's thin. It's a quick read. It's got some whimsical anecdotes and some, some, some important insights, I think. Um, also a lot of misogyny, very much glamorizing work, workaholic tendencies and you know, there was definitely a picture of a scientist. This was the way to succeed. Other options not really offered. And and I really struggled with that. I had a lot of imposter syndrome uh, coming up through. I mean, I'm, if someone asked me, when when did, I, when did I stop having imposter syndrome? I think maybe 2021. 
You know, very recently, I think I spent 20 years of my career having imposter syndrome, wondering if I was good enough, if I was, was going to make it. Am I going to, do I have what it takes? And constantly doubting and questioning it. Um, and I think that it would have been nice to, to not feel so alone at that period of, of my career. Um, so I think some of the things that were described in this original book um, were really important for academic research to be born as a thing. Like, how do we make this be a thing that you can get paid for? You know, how do we make this be a job that people get to have? And then at this point, I think most people would agree we need science. Science is important. We want to, we want to, we benefit from science. Um, and I think at this point, it's not so clear that we need elitism as much as we did before. It's not, um, we're, we're looking at a crumbling academic culture where, where we're struggling to retain people. And, you know, that's, it's not, it's not a great sustainable dynamic. I think trainees are not getting compensated well enough or treated, treated well enough that it's an attractive choice. And so I think we need to sort of make a change and no, nothing wrong necessarily about, about the intentions that were set hundreds of years ago, but things change and we're where we are now and things are changing very quickly. So um, I, I guess I get to make one of my childhood dreams, which is to, to write a book come true. Um, in, uh, I get in, in one of the benefits of social media, I did have a tweet kind of, you know, just sort of spontaneously ranting about, about how this book is problematic and it's very misogynistic. And maybe we need another book for other types of people. Um, and that, makes people feel more included. Um, and so, and, and this tweet went around and it, I didn't expect, you know, I didn't expect anything to come of this. I'm just, you know, living my daily life. And then my DM suddenly had literary agents and a book deal. And then, okay, I'm now I'm writing this book. And so I'm, I'm at me about halfway through, but I think the, the goal of the book, I, I don't really have time for this project to be honest, but it's such an important project to me. Um, I think that I I want to see academia be a uh, one of the healthiest places. Why is it second only to the military in the pervasiveness of sexual misconduct and you know things is that like right? yeah yeah and did you know that so actually you know factoid is academia is the military is worse in terms of sexual misconduct retaliation issues that occur but. Academia is second, and I and it makes you wonder what are the parameters that make this type of abuse so rampant. I think one of the obvious ones is the clear ranks, how stable the ranks are, how the power structure um, of academia and the military very fixed, not super debatable, not difficult to move these. The ranks are, you know, they're there, and the power structure is very skewed. And those are the ingredients that facilitate abuse. And so I think in the military, I could see a very good argument for why that hierarchy, that strict, rigid hierarchical structure is necessary. There's not time for making mistakes. Get it. But with academia, there's, there's time. There's, we're, what do we, we're not, you know, it's not a war. We're, we're just studying stuff that we think is cool. Why is uh, such a rigid hierarchy with such devastating consequences necessary? I would argue maybe it's not. And um, I think I've been spending a lot of time thinking about this for myself. I've been, um, I've, I found this professional leadership coach I, I love and just thinking about sustainability. How do we make an, a, a sustainable ecosystem? And um, it's not something you find in a lot of leadership management uh, literature that I that I've been exposed to. So uh, I'll take I'll take a note from from the the podcast and say if anyone knows of literature that talks about developing sustainable um, ecosystems within leadership and management, I would love to hear about that in the comments. But um, I think that's a big hole. Um, people think about making things stable. The power structure should be stable, but Actually, being flexible and dynamic is what gives systems resilience and, and flexibility um, to, to survive. And right now, 
you, all the cracks in, in the towers of academia are showing and it's time to, to see if this is, are we going to adapt and survive or are we going to crumble? There's a lot to unpack there and I'm grateful that you're drilling into all of that with, I'm sure the same rigor and um, attention to asking the really critical questions that you have in your lab. Um, certainly I observe the landscape changing very rapidly. Um, I think there's also a lot to be learned and to explore that um, exports to other professions. I certainly um, believe that the more um, first time opportunities to experience the beauty of doing research and biology in particular, because that's what I'm familiar with, um, the more likely that we are as a field of research and science to make more fundamental discoveries. In other words, the more people that get the experience of trying science, mm -hmm. doing exploratory research science, the more likely we are to pull from that pool. And within that pool, there will be people of competence, uh, talent, and also gifted. Like we're just, you know, sort of like increase the, the size of the net. Yeah. Um, and the net, of course, is netting something very specific, which is uh, you and I both know that um, while training certainly matters, knowledge is important, um, that ultimately, you know, love of craft and passion um, and just being tickled by that research bug. Once that neuron that, you know, gets tickled, that lets us see something for the first time or know something um, down the microscope or in a in a data plot or something, there's there's really no going back. So I I, you know, I want to be very clear that I loudly applaud your efforts to extend the experience of research to people. And earlier you were telling me that you're doing this, that many of the people in your lab are first time researchers. They didn't come through the pedigree of research. Yeah, no, we do a lot of outreach. About 25% of my lab this summer was first time research experiences. And so um, we've been really privileged to have the bandwidth to support that. Um, I will say though, I mean, on the same tip, I think what you've done with this podcast is incredible. You've made millions of people who didn't have access to science or neuroscience be fascinated with neuroscience. And now imagine what if every person that listened to this podcast and thought, this is such a great podcast. I wish I could do some neuroscience. It could do it with some, you know, not full time. What if they could contribute in any, just whatever level that they wanted to. That's so much more contribution that we're currently missing out on because there's so many barriers to be able to contribute to science. And I think um, removing the ones that are really there as well as the ones that are just perceived to be there is so powerful. But I mean, the podcast is a, a you know, proof, the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in this podcast, how many people could fall in love with science if they were given a chance to. Mm. Well, thank you for that. It is indeed a labor of love for me. And, um, and there are opportunities, maybe we'll provide a link to a couple of them, um, where, uh, certain projects in neuroscience are crowdsourcing data analysis. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite fun. There's the yeah. Connectome project where you yes. can trace neurons. It's actually very, very pleasing. You can do it while listening to podcasts yes. or a book. Kids can do it. You're, you're tracing these neurons, basically filling in lines. It's like a yeah. coloring book. Mm -hmm. And you're contributing to the parcellation of understanding the structure of, of the brain, yeah. including the human brain. And without that crowdsourcing, um, it's just not going to happen. I mean, there are efforts to make machine learning do it and to – do it through AI, but the, there's a lot to be gained from having actual humans do this that those technologies don't quite yet approximate. So we'll provide a link to to some of those projects. But listen, Kay, Dr. Tai, of course, um, I want to thank you so much, first of all, for coming here today and sharing so much knowledge and also being willing to go into some places that were, um, by virtue of my questions, a little bit speculative and, and, and really think about those and and, and address those through the lens of, of deep mechanistic understanding of how these circuits work and to make it clear to people. Um, your enthusiasm for science is infectious in the most positive sense of the word. And I know that so many people are going to benefit from, from your knowledge and also from the work that you've been doing in your laboratory. You know, I've seen your star rise and it's um, still going, 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 and it's just remarkable and extraordinary, but I must say not at all surprising. So um, that and your advocacy work 
and for all you do and that you're doing, um, I just, on behalf of myself and everyone listening, I just want to extend a, a genuine and really heartfelt thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's been such an honor to be on the Huberman Lab podcast. It's legendary. So thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. We'll do it again. Thank you for joining me for today's discussion all about the biology of social interactions with Dr. Kay Tai. To learn more about her work and to follow her on social media, please see the links in the show note captions. If you're learning from and or enjoying this podcast, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's a terrific zero cost way to support us. In addition, please subscribe to the podcast on both Spotify and Apple. And on both Spotify and Apple, you can leave us up to a five-star review. Please check out the sponsors mentioned at the beginning and throughout today's episode. That's the best way to support this podcast. If you have questions or comments about the podcast or topics or guests that you'd like to suggest for the Huberman Lab podcast, please put those in the comment section on YouTube. I do read all the comments. Not so much on today's episode, but on many previous episodes of the Huberman Lab podcast, we discuss supplements. While supplements aren't necessary for everybody, many people derive tremendous benefit from them for things like improving sleep, for improving hormone function, and for improving focus. To learn more about the supplements discussed on the Huberman Lab podcast, visit Live Momentous, spelled O-U-S, so that's livemomentous.com slash Huberman. If you're not already following me on social media, I am Huberman Lab on all social media platforms. So that's Instagram, Twitter, now called X, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Threads. And on all those platforms, I discuss science and science-related tools, some of which overlaps with the content of the Huberman Lab podcast, but much of which is distinct from the content covered on the Huberman Lab podcast. Again, that's Huberman Lab on all social media platforms. If you haven't already subscribed to our monthly Neural Network newsletter, our Neural Network newsletter is a zero-cost newsletter that includes podcast summaries and protocols as short one to three page PDFs. For instance, we have zero-cost protocols for improving sleep, for improving dopamine function, for deliberate cold exposure, for fitness, for learning and neuroplasticity, and much more. To sign up for the newsletter, simply go to hubermanlab.com Go to the menu tab, scroll down to newsletter, and supply your email. Again, the newsletter is completely zero cost, and I want to emphasize that we do not share your email with anybody. Thank you once again for joining me for today's discussion with Dr. K. Tai. And last, but certainly not least, thank you for your interest in science. 